This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1686, Top 5 Legacy Heroes. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Shane Kelly. And I'm Chris Everly. And there she be. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen, as we revisit the uh, time-honored format of the top five episodes. It's been a while since we've done one of these, but a few months back we got a great suggestion from one of our very favorite listeners and fellow podcasters who will be introducing himself in just a moment, and we are going to uh, go ahead with the top five legacy heroes, which is a subject near and dear to the kind of comics fandom exhibited by most of those participating in this discussion. All right, and the aforementioned suggester of this topic is... Ian Levenstein. That's the correct answer. <laughs> good to have you back with us, Ian. Good, good to be back for another top five. Yes, and it is a doozy. And uh, we are going to start uh, firing off our picks in this category in just a moment. But first of all, uh, we would like to uh, insert a word here in, uh, in uh, honor of our sponsor for this episode and a few others. And that is Dink, which is the Denver Independent Comics and Art Expo to be held at the McNichols Civic Center building in Denver on April 14th and 15th, 2018. And this is a, it's a, an independent focused comics convention which was started up by our good friend Charlie LaGreca, alias Charlito, uh, one of the co-founders of the Indie Spinner Rack podcast and a, just a dear friend of ours for years and years since we first got started with Comic Geek Speak. He lives out there in Denver these days and uh, Dink is uh, his brainchild. And uh, so he is, uh, uh, he is sponsoring a few episodes here to let folks know about this convention of his. And uh, for this episode, he's actually provided us with some copy uh, that we can read uh, to inform people about not only the convention, but the awards that are being held there, the Dinky Awards. So, and here goes, uh, here goes those words from Charlie to himself. A call to all artists and independent publishers to submit for the Central West's only comic and art awards, the 2018 Dinky Awards. Launched three years ago as part of the Denver Independent Comic and Art Expo, a.k.a. Dink, the Dinkies, capital D, lowercase i, capital N, capital K, capital Y, Dinkies, were the first ever Colorado awards to feature comics. Created in part by Charlie LaGreca, the innovator and co-founder of both Denver Comic Con and Dink, and the Indie Spinner Rack podcast, and Ted Intoricio, publisher of the award-winning winning Tinto Press. The Dinkies are a way to recognize excellence, promote independent art, and create a level playing field in which work is judged for its merits, not for the strength of its marketing campaign. The goal of the Dinkies is, not to, is to not only support, inspire, and create a sense of encouragement among the worldwide community of independent cartoonists, artists, and publishers, but also to serve to connect great work to a wider intended audience. The Dinkies feature over ten diverse categories and an unforgettable awards ceremony with celebrity host drunk Vanna White. That's V-A-N-N-A-H-W-H-Y-T-E. Nobody needs to be sued over this. The submission deadline is coming very soon. To submit your comic, graphic novel, or zine today, or to see previous winners, go to dinkdenver.com. Work must have been published between December 1st, 2016 and December 31st, 2017. Handcasted, handcrafted, and custom designed, all for the love of comics, dinkdenver.com. Excellent. Well done. With Charlito at the helm, it's bound to be a fun show to attend. So, April 14th and 15th, 2018 is when that is happening. So, if you're uh, interested, you're a publisher or creator of, uh, of a small press comic uh, and you're interested in participating in those Dinky Awards, uh, go to dinkdenver.com for details and submit soon. Hopefully, there will be puppets. <laughs> <laughs> Handmade puppets. He should go. He needs to go on a road trip someplace just so he can build the puppet in the back seat of whatever vehicle he's in, because that's that's where the magic happens. Absolutely, <laughs> and under the gun to get it done in a few seconds. And as I say this, I'm uh, saluting the shelf of uh, Comic Geek Speak Geek puppets yeah. produced by Charlito that uh, 
uh, they're, they're permanently squatting on a shelf above the door uh, here in our studio. Who can forget the Rios Puppets uh, presidential campaign? <laughs> Matt I Still got my buttons. I do too. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Ian has a wonderful topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, here, here. Very well, definitely that... Jones to do this. So. Yeah. They're, they're near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, considering uh, I'm a 90s kid uh, at heart. Uh, legacy heroes are very much what I grew up with. Because mm-hmm. That was when yeah. Marvel and DC were very much getting hot and heavy in that uh, to try to refresh their brand a little bit. So a lot of the earliest comics that I read were legacy comics. Mm. Yep, and I am right there with you, Ian. Now, do, do you want to give a specific definition, Ian, as a sort of a, a premise for the, the episode when you say legacy comic for the listeners? Sure. Um, so uh, a legacy comic to me uh, – a legacy comic or a legacy hero uh, for that matter um, to me – and you know what? I'll actually bring up exactly what I said in my email here because why the heck not? Um, for me, uh, it could be taken broadly or apply to uh, new iterations of older characters, i.e. You know, Barry Allen's Flash creation after Jay Garrick. Or it could be taken as characters that filled the role of an established hero for a short or a long time. Uh, so basically, you know, say like you know when Tony Stark was off of the sidelines, if a character replaced them and wasn't necessarily Iron Man, to me that's still a legacy character. Like War Machine to me would be a legacy character mm. because he, he took up the reign for, for a while there. Yeah, I would agree All right. with that. And as always, we, we're a... Uh, we're pretty broadly defining oh, gosh, yeah. and leaving plenty of room yeah. for you know, innovation or uh, individual interpretation. Yeah, because a few of the things on my list uh, uh, don't exactly fall within the parameters you said, Ian, but I think they're still legit. You know, so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean and, and that's the thing about, uh, about legacies in general. I mean, even, even one of the ones on my list uh, wouldn't necessarily – I mean, it could be interpreted as, as, a, as a legacy – uh, depending on on how you look at it, but he's definitely on my list because he had to be there. Uh, I would have felt wrong not including him. Mm. All right, I have one or two guesses as to who that might be, but we'll find out together. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're usually not that uh, uh, tight about uh, ranking things either when we go through these top five lists, and we always yep. throw in the uh, disclaimer that uh, whatever list we provide this week might be completely oh, different yeah. if we did the same thing yeah. a month hence. That's true. Indeed. As thoughts and tastes do vary. Uh, but, uh, uh, okay, so let's... Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, the way we usually do it is uh, we just kind of go uh, around the ring and everybody names their uh, number five on the, their, yeah. their top five list. And then we go back around uh, the, the, the ring and have everybody uh, elaborate upon uh, this character, their uh, reasons for choosing this character, etc. cetera. Uh, and then we go back around again and do the same thing with number four, number three, number two, number one. And then, of course, there's the anticipated uh, lightning round of alternates, if there be any. All right, uh, Ian, since uh, you are the uh, progenitor of this list, why don't you go first, and I will follow uh, suit as number number two. Okay. Uh, my number five is Kamala Khan, Ms. Ooh. Marvel. I thought you might have her on your list. Uh, my number five, this is one of the uh, sort of iffy ones, Damage. Ah. Nice. My number five is Batgirl. My number five is May Mayday Parker, Spider-Girl. Uh-huh. Excellent. All right, so uh, Kamala Khan made it onto my list for for many reasons. Uh, one, she she was sort of a sort of start of a of a diversity wave uh, with with Marvel Comics uh, that uh, that began around that time to try and give voices to people who may not have actually been recognized nor uh, really had someone that they, that they can relate to in the comic book world until that point. And uh, Kamala Khan, living out of New Jer- in Jersey City, for one, as opposed to New York. Uh, so that immediately makes her a little bit different than the mm-hmm. typical Marvel character, which are almost all based in New York, except for you know a few hit or misses here on the West Coast. Um, she is a, uh, a Muslim teenager who, uh, after uh, the events uh, of, of the Terrigen bomb, wound up gaining uh, inhuman abilities. Uh, which included a, a little bit of shape shifting, uh, stretching of her limbs, and uh, basically just being able to, uh, in a way, take up, take up the mantle of Ms. Marvel that was that was left by Carol Danvers when she became Captain Marvel. Um, and 
what I really appreciate about this character is the fun that was injected into it by G. Willow Wilson, while at the same time being incredibly respectful to uh, Muslim traditions and uh, just just really just making this character fully formed and not just a stereotype. Because think of how many that that did exist in in previous years of comic books. I mean, not nearly as much, you know, by the time that she was introduced, but there still was not that character that the average Muslim teen could relate to. And also, most importantly, a strong female teenage character. That was really cool to see. Um, and uh, they, they pulled it off nicely. Uh, Kamala's become a fixture both in comic books and in the animated uh, universes now of Marvel, because I know that she's been on the uh, on the Marvel uh, Avengers show on Disney XD, uh, I believe during their not their Civil War arc, then their Secret Wars arc, and she's going to be included in that new uh, incredibly diverse uh, animated movie that Marvel's making. I think it's I think it's called Marvel Next or something like that. Uh, that that uh, got announced about a month or two ago. Uh, that I'm really looking forward to. And, and yeah, she, she's different. Uh, she uses the word embiggen, which just makes me very, very happy to control her. Uh, you know, like, that's how she describes her stretching abilities, is that she embiggens and she gets, you know. <laughs> so that makes me really, really happy. And, yeah, she's just know that. She's a really cool character. Have you seen this week's episode of The Flash, Ian? I have not. Uh, it's. Uh, I actually was just catching up on Supergirl and uh, Arrow before we started recording here, so I'm still a little bit behind on Flash. I didn't watch last night's Flash, but I mm. watched last week's Flash with Elon. Yeah, <laughs> the elongated night rises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was yeah. good. If you're a fan of the word embiggen, Ian, you're, you're going to like that episode. I think <laughs> that makes me very, very happy. Then, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 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 also, like, I mean. In, in a way, Kamala Khan has begun a, a new generation of, of heroes over at Marvel, even with the Avengers, because you know she was an Avenger for a while there on Mark Waite's beginning of his run, and then uh, wound up reviving the long-forgotten champion's name once they got the rights back to being able to use it. Uh, and uh, her, her, her time on that team was a lot of fun, too. So I, I want to see Kamala Khan grow as a character and you know, be around for a long, long time. And whether G. Will Wilson's writing her or not... I think Marvel's going to treat her right. Well, I certainly hope so, Ian. I, I, I fully agree with you about Kamala. I mean, I've, she's one of the first five names I wrote down on, on this piece of paper here. I mean, she didn't make the final cut, but uh, she would have been pretty high up to the top of the uh, list of uh, runners-up. Um, yeah, I actually collected uh, every issue of her series up to the point where it uh, was bumped up to three ninety nine cover price, which mm. point I thought I'd let it go. But uh, it was a good jumping-off point because that's where they renumbered the series. Um, but yes, in, in that time, I, I got to know and like Kamala and her group of friends uh, there in uh, Jersey City, which, you know, which is the most ethnically diverse city of its size in the United States. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a great setting for a superhero sh- uh, series, and Kamala, is a, she's a great character. I mean, it's uh, interesting as a legacy character that they went with such a radically different uh, power set than what uh, Carol Danvers used to have, but um, yeah, she's... She, she's just a fully developed personality, as you said, Ian. I mean, it's, and, and more than that, she's a likable personality, which is very important to me as a reader. Uh, so I, I, look, I, I love her and her, her family situation. I've, I, I agree that G. Willow Wilson does a very good job of sensitively portraying uh, Muslim life in America, since she is a recent convert to Islam herself. So she's kind of writing from an insider perspective, you might say, but can also see the other side of things. Um, so she's yeah she's she she I'm glad that she's in the vanguard of a new more diverse crop of superhero characters. She's uh, more worthy than most out there. And one of my favorite things about her is is her fangirling over other heroes in the Marvel universe mm-hmm. because you know like with the Tumblr generation and stuff like that like she's very much embraced that part. I mean I mean she's written fanfic <laughs> like that, that that just immediately makes me happy. There was a, there was a an annual that was written of her fanfic. You can't get better than that. <laughs> well, I hope I've got that in my collection. <laughs> I think forward. it was an issue of Avengers, if memory serves. Oh, all right. And Ian, you also make a very good point in that, uh, you know, Muslims until recently, and even still in many cases, are, have been so demonized in our society. Yep. Um, and I think it's very important considering not only for our own society, but the United States' role in the world in the Middle East, that people get a better understanding of 
people of that faith and just how ultimately they're you know just people <laughs> like everybody else so uh here here yeah and, and they they do that even with her with her parents her parents are not stereotypes they care about her very very much but they're traditional right and and, and that's that's really nice to see all right murd fire away okay uh so i went with uh, damage you know and this is an example of a, a legacy character that uh uh, never actually filled in for uh, an existing uh, uh, named uh, superhero character, but uh, who is nonetheless very directly uh, familiarly connected, uh, genetically connected, uh, to uh, some existing uh, DC Universe characters. Uh, Damage was introduced uh, back in very early 1994. And uh, this, I was at that time barely 15 years old. I had only been collecting comic books for about a year and a half. And uh, I had... I think Damage was maybe the second DC series that I ever tried off the shelf, or if not, not, not much uh, higher than second. Uh, I, I know I tried the, the Green Lantern Emerald Twilight storyline in uh, late 1993, and then I, I guess I, I tried Damage because here was a brand new character, and I was a brand new reader to the DC universe. I thought this was a pretty good opportunity for me to get in on the ground floor, um, and uh, that here was this uh, young teenage character about the same age I was at that time. Uh, his name was uh, Grant Emerson, and his power was basically uh, emitting these... Well, his power was... His power was symbolic of uh, adolescent rage, shall we say. It's, uh, he, he took the uh, destructive impulses and uh, violent feel- mood swings and feelings of adolescence, and uh, he channeled it into these uncontrollable, explosive, destructive energy blasts and caused a lot of damage. You know, it's kind of how he came by the name. Um, and uh, so then he embarked... Well, once his powers manifested, he then very quickly discovered that the people who had been raising him, the Emerson family, were not his real parents, that his real parents were pre-existing superhumans or metahumans somewhere in the DC universe. And he embarked on a several-issue-long quest to discover uh, his background, his origins, his true parentage, and his place in the DC universe. Uh, and so it, he, he, was a, he was the result of a... Uh, shadowy genetic manipulation project called Project Telemachus, which tickled my uh, fancy as a a young student of classical mythology back then. Uh, uh, Telemachus was the son of Odysseus, you see. And uh, uh, Telemachus, uh, like uh, young Grant Emerson, grew up without knowing his real father. So um, we readers got to follow along with Grant as he sort of blasted his way across the landscape of the DCU, making friends and enemies along the way. Um, And eventually... uh, uh, this went on for a while. He discovered that he contained – his genetic blueprint was like a genetic cocktail of many different pre-existing Golden and Silver Age DC characters. So he had a whole lot of potential power in him, which never really got developed. I mean, the, the series lasted maybe 20 issues and uh, then got you know, – due to lack of reader interest, was discontinued. The character continued to kick around DC for a while. He joined uh, the New Titans uh, fairly near the end of that, uh, that volume. Uh, in the the mid-90s, before it was cancelled and Dan Jurgens' Teen Titans came along. Then eventually he became a member of the Freedom Fighters, where he studied under uh, Roy Lincoln, the human bomb, whose power set was very similar. And then, much later on, Jeff Johns made him a member of the Justice Society of America. Uh, But... uh, uh, because, you know, it's, uh, the, the, this is following up on something that uh, Grant actually learned much uh, prior to that. He is actually the genetic son. I mean, he has the genetic material of lots of other super beings in him, but he is actually the son of uh, Al Pratt, the Golden Age Adam, with his uh, you know, atomically mutated genes, which gave him his atomic super strength, and uh, Al Pratt's wife, Mary James Pratt. Uh, so there, there's your most direct uh, uh, legacy line there, but as I've said a couple of times already, he also had the genetic material of lots of other characters in him, and that, that could have been followed through more completely if he'd kept his own ongoing series. As it is, uh, that uh, part of his background kind of got uh, backburnered and forgotten about, and uh, he was just had to be content with just being the explodey guy who was uh, the son of uh, Al Pratt for the rest of his existence. He ended up dying then uh, sometime much later, and... Uh, not too long before the uh, Blackest Night event, I believe. But, uh, yeah, this, uh, it, it's largely 90s nostalgia, I guess you could say, that's informing me here. But uh, I, I, I related to young Grant Emerson as a neophyte DC Comics fan back then, and I related to his, his powers, as, you know, just as, as I've said, are kind of a metaphor for the uh, experience of being an adolescent male. Um, 
And uh, his quest to discover his past was kind of like a quest for me as a new DC reader to learn something about the past of the DC universe, which ultimately brought us all the way back to the Golden Age and to uh, Damage's real father, the Golden Age Adam. So he's... Uh, and I always kind of felt sorry for him that he never really found a comfortable niche for himself. He, he, he still c- continued to bounce around until he finally died. And now DC is using his name and applying it to like some fairly flimsy Hulk analog that they're trying to publish. And, yeah. and I'm a little sorry about that because that means that Grant Emerson probably doesn't have a place in the new 52 or DC Rebirth universe. But I remember you, Grant, and I remember you fondly. So he's uh, damages on my list at number five. I always oh, felt right. like he got a little overshadowed by Adam Smasher. Oh, yeah. And was, there some, uh, was there kind of a, like a sibling rivalry between them in the Justice yeah. Society of America series? I haven't read that far yet. Uh, th- there, there definitely was. Uh, they, they, they went into it at times, uh, but it felt like they, uh, they fleshed out Adam Smasher way more than they did Damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, damage, in fact, I, I think he might even leave the team earlier than uh, than, than Adam Smasher was. And I know Adam Smasher had a whole thing with uh, with Black Adam too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. where he took a lot more prominence in that in that series. Right. I think I'm just about up to the Black Rain story where uh, yeah, where Adam Smasher goes off to join Black Adam. Yeah. And then Damage, I think. Uh, yeah, it was during Final Crisis. I think he got uh, his face was damaged, and I think he was just really bitter and like a c- complete surly asshole as a result of that. It's that was the way Johns <laughs> chose to to play him. Yeah. Um, my choice of Batgirl is partially nostalgia, like what you say about Damage Murd, but in the way that growing up when I did, we had the 60s TV show on rerun on, I believe it was Fox from Philly. Um, back then you didn't know anything about seasons. You didn't know anything about episode guides or who appeared when. You just waited until you saw Batgirl swing across the opening credits. Like, oh, my God, Batgirl's in this episode. <laughs> um, so as a, as a kid, I loved that. Uh, not only did that show make me fall in love with Batman, Robin, but then Batgirl as well. Um, and that spilled over into Super Friends, and, and my love of comics shot off from there. What DC then did, not only did they take Batgirl and an interesting story in The Killing Joke – and gave Barbara purpose as Oracle, which was fantastic. Um, they also brought in various people then to play Batgirl. And this is before I ever knew about Betty Kane, which Murd and I were talking about before the show started, as Batgirl. Um, so for me, growing up, it was always Barbara first. And then um, everybody f- after. And it, it wasn't until years later, probably, gosh, I had to be in my 20s when I really started to learn about golden age Batgirl and Batwoman. Uh, But I loved what DC did with bringing in um, Stephanie eventually as Batgirl. There was a time when Cassie Kane was Batgirl, Um, both very different interpretations of the character, yet still grounding them in that, in that Batgirl luring and giving some respect to everything that had happened before. Um, I even think that there were stories where Barbara approved of them being Batgirl, which I always like to see that too. Um, I think Stephanie Brown's tenure as Batgirl was cut a little bit too short. Um, I, I enjoyed that series a lot. It, it was a lot of fun uh, to see her progress into that into that role. And I think uh, there's definitely a place for a Batgirl in the universe. And, and I'm, I'm just as happy that, that they've brought Barbara back to doing it. I think everything that's come out from the New 52 and uh, the Rebirth has been, for the most part, really well done for done. Batgirl. Um and I hope they continue it. I don't want to see that character grow away. Yep. And I'm glad that they've kept the uh, Oracle part of her background as a part of oh, her backstory. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's one thing I really didn't want to see go away. And and I wish that they – sometimes I wish they would have just left her as Oracle because I really thought that that was such a strong character and gave her so much more purpose. I shouldn't say it that way. Gave her a purpose – being paralyzed in a wheelchair and so effective mm-hmm. and touched every team, every character in the DC universe. Uh, but it's nice to see Barbara back in the 
good old Batgirl outfit. I mean, I know it's been tweaked and changed a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's it's still a lot of fun to read her as Batgirl again too. So, mm-hmm. so I, I I'm kind of torn in that way that I really would have loved her to stay Oracle, mm-hmm. but I do love having Barbara Gordon back as yeah. Batgirl, especially as written by Julian Shaw. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. In the Birds of Prey, it's just it, it's just a fantastic title. Um, I'm I'm personally glad that uh, Stephanie at least has a place in the current DC universe. Because I am for too. A while- yeah, because for a while there, she didn't have any at all, and now yeah. she's back as spoiler. Uh, she's been in the Detective Comics series mm. uh, as, as part of that uh, team of uh, co-bat people running around Gotham City and being trained by Batwoman and, uh, and Batman in recent years. So yeah. that uh, I've been happy to see that. But yeah, I, I loved Stephanie's run on Batgirl, Shane. That was well, easily one of my favorites. And, and even Cassie... Kane has a place in this new universe too. I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, isn't she also a part of that Bat Team in Detective Comics? Ian? I thought so. She is. Yeah. Um, I think her name is. Uh, her name for a while was Orphan. I forget. Mm. I forget what her name is now. But I know uh, that okay. they've they've given her some other Bat moniker. Mm. And that's that's one title where I have all the issues, but I am a good year behind on Detective right now. Um, that's one that's on my next pile of catching up to do. So yeah. This year's annual just came out today. So oh. It's the uh, uh, DC Rebirth uh, Origin of Clayface. Oh, nice. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've been really happy that, that these characters that played Batgirl also have a place in the current DC universe like that as well. It, it, oh. It's just a lot of fun to see them all together. Mm-hmm. Always. Shane, well spoken, brother. Well spoken. All right. All right, this uh, – so my fifth entry, my, my first entry, I should say, is uh, <clears throat> May May Day Parker, Spider-Girl. And this is a, tr- is a shout-out to my – our dear friend and comrade at arms, Dan, Danny Boy Ken Jill out in Pittsburgh because <laughs> it's a book both he and I loved and, and read uh, all through the years. Uh, you may recall this character came out of Marvel's uh, short-lived MC- – was it MC2? MC2, yeah. The name? yeah. Yep, thank you. I know I kind of wanted me to confirm that uh, where they introduced uh, – I guess like a series of legacy characters, right? Exactly. There was uh, J2, yeah. the son of the Juggernaut. There was A-Next, which is a whole team. But but she came in first in a <laughs> what-if issue, didn't she? Yes, she did. And Correct. that what-if yes, issue was a, a high-ticket uh, back issue for a while there. Yes, it was. And I sold that promptly and made some good buck on it when I had it. Good for you. For you. Well done, sir. You're, you're, you're a, a skillful speculator. <laughs> um, but uh, I love this book from the from the outset. Um it was Tom DeFalco uh, wrote the entire series, uh, and it was penciled. Uh, let's see, was it Pat Olive? He started off. He started off, and then I think with the Ron Friends take over at some point. That's what um, I was remembering. And Al Williamson inked, so it was it was a hell of a creative team. And what I loved about the book was it really captured the feel of you know the Peter Parker teenage Spider Man, but you know it's his daughter in the in this you know possible future. Um, who's the, she's the daughter of Peter and Mary Jane, and uh, Defalco really found her voice effectively. And he, you know, he took her, he took you through her high school career. You know, he balanced nicely the typical high school misadventures that you're going to find in a Marvel comic in that type of context, and then also, you know, dealing with legacy heroes, legacy villains, which they had a ball with in that series, as well as some of her father's, you know, old nemeses. And uh, you know, they really focused on. Her trying to live up to, you know, the Spider-Man mantle, so to speak, but also trying to find her own identity. That they, they, she had an interesting relationship with um, uh, Normie Osborne, Harry Osborne's son. Uh, I mean, Defalco, you know, as you know, wrote a, lot, a significant run on Amazing Spider-Man, so he's really he was really tapping into the history of the character in that universe. And if you're a Spider-Man fan, uh, and if you especially love like Silver Age Spider-Man or like Peter Parker as a teenager Spider-Man, definitely check this series out because. It's really a, a really a loving tribute to, to that sort of aspect of, of, of the character's history, and uh, I, I enjoyed it from beginning to end. Uh, I re- thought it was a consistently well done comic that uh, you know appealed to I think to a, a wide cross section of, of readers. And it's the only MC2 comic that really lasted. I mean, that kind mm-hmm. of when that when that label folded, that, that they continued Spider Girl for quite some time. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think a fan. Letter campaign saved it from cancellation more than yes, once. Yes, it did. I was going to save that. Say that it was. It was at least once, maybe twice, that that happened. Yeah. So that's my number five. It also holds the distinction of uh, one of the, I think, of two comic books that I have had a letter published in. Oh, nice. Oh. Back, back. Uh, I remember there was a uh, a bulletin board for Spider Girl back in the day, 
that uh, DeFalco frequented, and he he asked for uh, for letters to be posted on there, and I wound up uh, getting my letter posted in an issue there. I I owned I owned all the issues for years until I until I sold them off at one point, but uh, it was it was absolutely fantastic, uh, and one of the few titles that actually remembered that the '90s run of Spider Man existed for a while. Ha! Hmm. Huh. <laughs> Right, yeah, like the that yeah. daughter that uh, Peter and Mary Jane actually had. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. It's a good point, Ian. And I have some original art from this series. Some of it I sold when I, I closed my shop, but I, I kept one uh, page that is a wonderful origin page of the Green Goblin, nice. and like they show Osborne in the explosion. Then the last panel is him donning the mask. It's it's it's, I treasure it. I also appreciated her, her uh, the version of her that was in Earth X. Uh, the, uh, oh yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah uh, where where she was, uh, she had been uh, merged with the Venom symbiote, and she had a very tumultuous relationship with uh, with Peter, and that uh, because of that. But uh, they they seemed to have a actual like symbiotic relationship where neither one was taking full control, but still with Peter's history of Venom, you know, what's he going to do about that? Mm. Right. All right, door number four. All right. I'll go first this round, and my number four is Airwave. Ha! Fantastic, Mert. My number four, and this is the last Bat Universe one, is Robin. You promise? Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, uh, I... one of mine was going to be Tim Drake, so I'm glad you said it. I <laughs> guess that one, too. My uh, number four is Jenis Vell slash Captain Marvel. Was yeah, he was on your list again? He was on my list, so I'm going with an alternate. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with, you know, I, I was going to say him eventually. I might as well say him now for number four. Mark Grayson, Invincible. I, I'm four for four. <laughs> <laughs> so he was one of very few non-Marvel or DC legacy characters I could think of, but I, was, I thought, ah, Ian's going to do him. So. <laughs> yep. All right, so Airwave. This is, of course, the second Airwave. Um, you know, the original Airwave was a Golden Age character, and he uh, was a guy who uh, roller skated across telephone lines to get from one side of the city to the other, and he had a pet parrot named Static that he could talk to, and uh, he was one of the sillier concepts uh, from uh, uh, DC National back in uh, the Golden Age of comics. Uh, but... Uh, uh, no character was left behind, uh, as, as DC began mining its backstory in uh, the 70s, actually, already. Um, and uh, so uh, Airwave uh, did experience something of a renaissance in the mid-70s uh, when uh, he, it was revealed that he had had a son. Now, uh, now well, th there is sort of a, uh, a little confusion between Earth-1 and Earth-2 residency here as far as uh, the first and second Airwaves go. Um, and it's one that Roy Thomas never got around to ironing out. As a crisis came along before uh, Roy got down his list of uh, trouble to shoot. Um, as far as uh, a parallel Earth uh, Golden Age character-related uh, enigmas went. Um, but yeah, the, so the, the original Airwave was a Golden Age character. He was supposed to live on Earth 2. But uh, his son, uh, the second Airwave, uh, was definitely active on Earth 1. Not only that, but apparently the, uh, he had family on Earth 1. I might as well mention here that uh, the original Airwave's name was Larry Jordan, yeah. and his son's name was Harold, nicknamed Hal Jordan. <laughs> and it's, t huh? it's tempting to say no relation, but that's not true at all, because there is relation. Apparently, somehow, despite having been born on different parallel Earths, uh, Larry Jordan, the Golden Age Airwave, was a cousin of Hal Jordan, the Silver Age Green Lantern. <laughs> Uh, I didn't so, know that. <laughs> so when uh, little, huh. little Hal came along, he apparently was a metahuman. It, I, I, from what I understand, he was born with the ability to convert himself into uh, electrostatic energy. Hmm. Um, and uh, so as a, I guess he was uh, then sent to live with uh, uh, both his father's and the older Hal's cousins, Jack and Jan, in Texas. And eventually, uh, big cousin Hal came along and uh, caught up with little cousin Hal and realized that he had these powers. And for a while there, the, uh, the new Bronze Age airwave uh, was a, sort of a protege of the hard-traveling hero team of uh, Hal Jordan, Ollie Queen, and Dinah Lance, the oh, Black Canary. Yeah, I didn't know that. Another sort of Earth-1, huh. Earth-2 straddler there, the Black Canary. Yeah. Uh, though her, uh, the, the situation with her was eventually ironed out. Uh, the airwave family, not so much. Um, so, yeah, uh, 
And uh, the, the, the original Airwave was killed by a, a criminal that he'd sent to jail in his secret identity as a district attorney. Um, his uh, little Hal's mother then donned the Airwave costume and got revenge, but she ended up dying in the attempt, I think. So little Hal was an orphan, and uh, big cousin Hal and uh, Ollie and Dinah were pretty much all he had. So for a while there, he was... Uh, you know, you know, talking about your legacies here, not only does he bear the mantle of a Golden Age character, he also learned among some of the uh, leading lights of the second generation of yeah. superheroism in the DC universe. Yeah, he was uh, introduced by uh, uh, Denny O'Neill, actually, during mm-hmm. the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, the 100th issue of the Green Lantern, Green Arrow oh, wow. series. And so he, he was a neat character. He had a lot of potential. His power was to convert himself to energy, as I said, and uh, whereas his dad could just, you know, like roller boogie across the telephone lines, <laughs> he could actually travel through them. I always thought that was a cool power to have. Um, yeah, the first uh, superhero I tried making up when I was a, a little shaver was a guy who could turn himself into sound. So this is really pretty similar. Yeah. Um, for a while there, he actually had a backup series, uh, of his, like a solo backup series in action comics uh, written by Bob Rosakis. Didn't last all that long. And, well, in the end, he's just – he's one of these characters that – these oddballs that I like to adopt. You know, mm-hmm. he's, he's a character that I saw a lot of promise in, one of these Bronze Age oddities that was kind of a victim of the DC implosion, among other things. And uh, He could have been a really cool character. He certainly had everything going for him, but somehow nobody came up with quite the right take on him. So, like, he, he, even, he had it worse than damage, actually, come down to it. He just kind of kicked around in the background of the DC universe, was used every once in a while. He all but became a villain for a time there. Yeah. And, uh, he joined a group of uh, capitalist heroes called the Captains of Industry. This was in John Ostrander's <laughs> run on, on uh, Firestorm. He changed his name to Mazer. That didn't stick, fortunately. Airwave is a much cooler name anyway. Yeah. And ultimately, he died in a comic written by Jeff Johns. You begin to see a pattern emerging here. Johns yeah. is both the best friend and the worst enemy of legacy <laughs> at, at DC Comics. Uh, but, yeah, he's another character who's... who's Passing, I mourn. You know, it's, I'm just sorry that uh, little Hal, one of these little you know, strange Bronze Age characters, that I, little foundlings that I like to collect the appearances of, um, I'm, I'm just sorry that he didn't have a better run. And uh, I'm just glad that he got to have that little stretch by Bob Rosakis in Action Comics to strut his stuff as a solo. Wow. Now, Murr, did he die heroically? What were the, the circumstances of his death? I believe he died during Infinite Crisis or just before. Oh, okay. He was part of an away team of heroes out in space. Oh, and, yes. Yes, and, he did. Uh, his signal kind of got – He was trying to connect all people on one of the planets. I don't remember if it was Ran or Thanagar so that messages could get out to wherever they needed to go. Right. And he ended and, up literally stretching his yeah, signal way too thin. a little too thin and he just kind of got split yeah. up into loose photons yep. and scattered throughout the universe. Yep. Easily sounds like they could have just, you know, had him had the signal come back together and have him return, but uh, then that's he still black as, as dead. So right, yeah. right, right. He showed up as a Black Lantern. So if that doesn't equal dead in a Jeff Johns controlled DC universe, nothing does. Yeah, <laughs> they could still find a way in the Rebirth series. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible in this new DC universe yeah. that we might see Little Hal again. Yeah. In fact, honestly, I'd like to see it just just hmm. to flesh out Hal Jordan's uh, family sure. a little bit. Sure. I'm totally on board with that, too, Ian. Now, um, with Robin, even more so than Batgirl, you need a Robin. Mm-hmm. You have a Batman, you have to have a Robin. Um, I love that they took Dick Grayson and allowed him to grow up to be Nightwing. I think that's one of the best progressions of a character that I've seen in my comics reading history ever. Um I love that they brought in I, – I happen to be one of those that like Jason Todd. I didn't have any problem with him. Um, I was shocked when they did the whole phone number thing to get rid of him. <laughs> but I'm glad uh, that they sort of cleverly brought him back, even though some people didn't agree with it back then either, um, back into the DC universe. I love Tim Drake, one of the – if not the best Robin. I, I love Dick Grayson as Nightwing, but, boy, Tim Drake really is, to me, the best Robin there ever was. Here, here. Um, the stories that he went through, the growing up, the way they allowed him to figure out who Batman was and to grow into his own title, which I have had in the past every issue and read every issue. Uh, loved the Red Robin series that he went into when Bruce Wayne and Batman disappeared for a while. Um, I think that series was cut too short. And um, then to bring Damien into the fold, who I, I was not too keen on at first, but I, I've grown to... To like Damien as a character, um, and I, I appreciate the the 
the literal legacy that is happening there between Bruce Wayne, Batman, mm-hmm. and his son, Damien. Yeah. It's always been a father-son relationship, so yeah. it's nice that it can be an actual An actual son. son. So uh, then to bring them all together in this New 52 and Rebirth that they all had and still have a part in the Bat universe, let alone the DC universe, uh, it really does just warm my heart a little bit the, that there is always and will always be a Robin. Um, I think it's one of DC's strongest legacy characters – and I hope they don't ever do away with it. I, I I think that would be very disappointing. I know they've they've tried or alluded to it at times with, oh, I don't need a Robin. Oh, I don't. No, Batman needs a Robin. Hmm. There, there's there's a Batman. There's a Robin. Um, so I'm very happy that they've kept it around and, and allowed not only different characters to portray Robin, but allowed the character of Robin itself to change and make sense for anything that they want to do with it. Um, yeah, it's 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 been a fun ride to to watch it all progress since really I came on board when Jason Todd was becoming Robin, and then from then on learned about Dick Grayson and Nightwing and all that. Like from his first, from Jason Todd's first appearance, not or? necessarily his very first appearance. I mean, I knew who Dick Grayson was, um, but reading comic books, I started with um, God, was it four hundred one or something when the new version of Jason mm, Todd was stealing right. the hubcaps off the Batmobile? Yeah, that was the, the first post-crisis Batman yeah, story. That's where I came in, and then learned about Jason Todd going backwards a little bit. Mm, yeah, and well, then really learned about Dick Grayson as Robin, where I had known him as Nightwing at that point. So, um, I, I, I think one of the few things that disappointed me about the Batman the animated series of mm-hmm. the nineties was that they mixed and matched the origins of yeah. Tim Drake and Jason Todd. That uh, Tim Drake had way more of a Jason Todd mm-hmm. origin yeah. where you know, his family was involved in crime mm-hmm. and that... Uh, and he that himself he was, was a smart-mouthed little brat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, to me, that lost the vision there to the point where sitting on fanfiction.net somewhere is a... <laughs> is a fa- is a fan fiction that I wrote in the Batman the Animated Series universe oh. <laughs> uh, called Batman Beyond a Day in the Dark that I never wound up finishing that introduced Jason Todd into the animated series universe with Tim Drake's on- origin. Okay. <laughs> Just to sort of like do <laughs> yeah. a reversal. There. Balance right. that out. <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, Tim, Tim's, Tim's my man. I yeah. I grew up with them, and you know the whole Young Justice crew were were mm-hmm. my favorites growing up. And Tim continues to be one of the uh, most tactical Robins. Oh gosh, yeah, and that, and that has never happened, even as, even as Red Robin. Again, I'm behind on my detective reading, so I I know what's going to happen as I get caught up. But I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who does or does not know it or read it. Um, yeah. But early on in, in this Rebirth Detective comic series, I was absolutely shocked when I turned a page and then got to the end of the book and got another shock. And then to have what's going to be happening as I catch up happen, um, I just really love what they're doing with all the Robin characters, all the all the people who have portrayed Robin. Again, still have a place in the universe. Even Carrie what Kelly. About- yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Even Carrie Kelly. Um, Stephanie Brown as Robin was fantastic. I wish that – would have lasted longer than it did. I thought that was cut way too short. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a lot of fun to, to watch and read. Uh, I just wish one some of, my, of them... I've... Go ahead. Sorry, Shane. Um, one of my fondest memories of Tim Drake, I'm not as well read in the character as some of you guys are, but I love the relationship he developed with the spoiler. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the issues where she, I think she was pregnant, for example. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. That, that, that was, I think Chuck Dixon was writing Robin at that time, if I remember correctly. Uh I agree 100%. Just, I think his character has been very fleshed out very well. I like how they established he had a very different personality than and 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 background than you know Dick Grayson or Jason Todd. Um, in some ways, he was I thought found him more of a grounded Robin, mm-hmm. uh, just the way he conducted himself, and uh, I, I thought his, his his the way he played off Bruce slash Batman I thought was really well done, but. Great pick, Shane, because, I mean, when you think about it, that's one of the richest legacy characters of all. Oh, yeah, and everything so. that happened with, with Tim's own family then with his mother and his father throughout history, right through Infinite Crisis. Um, yeah, it, it was really something to read all that. And and, and of, of all the Robins, including Damien, uh, Tim is the only one I could actually see becoming Batman someday. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Tim is, he's my favorite Robin also. He's, he's on my list of alternates. Um, he's, you know, I, I, I agree to- totally with what Chris said a moment ago about him being among the most grounded Robins. Mm-hmm. You know, he's coming to it for, for good, level-headed reasons, being the only Robin who actually sought the job out as opposed to simply being scooped out of the gutter yeah. by mm-hmm. a fellow orphan Batman. Um, and, and one piece of praise that I will he- uh, give him now. Um, as a young reader, he is the one character above all others that I've found I related to him more than I did any other character I saw in comics. I mean, he was a very believably written teenaged character. And the, the, the lines that were put in his mouth, the voice that he was given by the people writing him, Chuck Dixon, John Lewis, etc., going on up through the middle of the 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, every single thing he said during the first, like, 15 years of his existence seemed to me like something that I would have said. So, yes, and he's, I, I was never quite as smart as Tim is, of course. I don't have uh, his uh, deductive capabilities. No, but no. but no, just his, his personality, his level-headedness, his groundedness, as mm-hmm. Chris said. It's, uh, that, that's what made him kind of a refreshing read to me. And I agree with Ian that he's probably, the, of all the Robins, he's the most worthy of the Bat legacy. The other mm-hmm. two, I mean, they're, 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 they're strong characters, too, but they have their own style, their own personality, their own motives for doing what they do. And they, they're not quite in sync with the Bat mythos, so, which is fine. All right, and uh, Ian, I want to emphasize, we can certainly overlap. You're welcome to take uh, Jenna's Vell as one of your uh, main entries, sir. <laughs> um, I, I have so many on here. Uh, I, as my list goes forward, uh, I, I might as well just, uh, just talk about it a little bit after you're done, sir. Sure. So the main reason I picked this character is because of Peter David. Um, his, his Captain Marvel series, or Captain Marvel, which focused on Jenna's Vell, the, the son of you know the Starlin uh, Captain Marvel. For me, it was one of the best Marvel series. What was that? Early two thousands. Mm-hmm. That series is out. Yeah, um, it was so well done. Uh, you had some great artwork by I think it was Chris Cross, one of the main artists uh, on that book. And it's Peter David, so you had great humor, um, but you also had you know because he's one of the top writers in the business, so you ha- you know he really, really plunged into. You know, again, the legacy. In fact, Janice Vell used to be called Legacy, if I remember correctly. I think that was his original moniker. That's absolutely uh, right. When he first appeared yeah. back in 1993, Silver Surfer Annual Number no. Six. Yeah, in his, in his bad 1990s hairstyle and costume. <laughs> oh, the pony. Um, yeah. Luckily, by the time Peter David got his hands on, they they had him in a much uh, different look. Um, and you know, he, it was it was loving the original Captain Marvel character. It was always a treat month to month to see how Dave was exploring that history and how Janice Vell was tied into that and just, you know, the cosmic adventures he got into, some of which were tied into, you know, his father's past that established a wonderful relationship with Rick Jones. Um, and, you know, so that, that, that partnership was in a sense renewed just with this, with this new version of, of Captain Marvel. Um, and it was just, it was fun. Like it, it was really well done. There was a lot of great, Humor in the book, uh, but 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 pathos too, and and you sense the burden that sometimes Janice Vell felt uh, as as sort of the new Captain Marvel essentially. And uh, there was, I mean, there's a series of issues. Um, I think Alex Ross is doing the covers where he kind of lost his mind essentially and was was a, uh, abusing his powers and his cosmic awareness and so forth. But if you want to really re- read a series that may, may, many people may not remember much now, but there was that period where that, for me, that was one of the best titles Marvel was producing uh, in the early 2000s. I remember there was, I remember there was a, was there an issue? I think they actually relaunched with new numbering at one point. Um, oh yeah. And they had Alex, Alex Ross covers, and they had Janisville in the original Silver Age, you know, the Cree uniform that his father wore when he was in the military of the Cree. Uh, but a consistently outstanding book, uh, issue after issue. So and high high praise, and they also used that character very effectively in um, the classic Avengers Forever, Kurt Busiek, uh, Carlos Pacheco classic, which we talked about a couple of years ago uh, on this program. Right, that was where so the, it's, it's, that's where the version of the character that uh, Peter David wrote uh, came from, actually, when he evolved from the ponytailed '90s version to the cosmically aware, like white-haired version or a uh, short-haired version. Brother Murd, well done. Mm-hmm. As and always, you, you, you compensate for my shortcomings, sir. Slipping them in where so, I can, Chris, that's all. <laughs> that, but, that, uh, yeah, you go ahead, Ian, I'm sorry. Rewatch, by the way, so don't worry about it. Uh, that rewatch, by the way, Chris, that was all part of the You Decide event yep. back in the day uh, when, when Bill Jameis thought he knew how to write comics <laughs> and, uh, and challenged uh, 
Peter David to a duel uh, where uh, it, it was Captain Marvel versus uh, whatever the heck his the name of his comic was. Marvel. Uh, to, oh, God. <laughs> You're right. Marvel. Ugh. Marvel, uh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, whichever one sold better would be able to continue. And to this day, I'm still not 100% certain whether or not that was a marketing ploy or whether that was just how pompous Bill Jamis was. I choose to believe the former is true, actually. Quesada got into the act, too, remember. He did something called something adventures, like Ultimate Marvel Adventures, I think. That's what it was, yep. Introduced a couple of Batman and Robin analogs called Hawk Owl and Sparrow, I oh, think. Oh, I forgot about that. So, so yeah, all three of them That's were right. in competition. Yep. But I'm pretty sure that uh, Jemis and Quesada weren't taking their books in any way seriously. They were just doing it as uh, a form of uh, beneficial hucksterism, you know, just to, to help drum up more attention for Peter David's worthy Captain Marvel series. Right. Yeah. But no, Genesis was one of my favorite characters, uh, without a doubt, coming out of Avengers Forever. And I, ha- I had that entire run. And uh, I'm disappointed that more of it is not traded to this day. Because uh, I know that they, they had a volume one out that I, that I have on my shelf that's like really hard to find at this point. Because I know they, it's been out of publication for, for years now. And I, they they might have published a little bit of the You Decide run, uh, but I... There's nothing full. Like, there's no complete Captain Marvel. Well, I, I would hope they would do an omnibus of the whole series eventually. I would hope so, too. Yeah. 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 It could go either way. I mean, we do have a Carol Danvers-starred uh, Captain Marvel movie on the horizon. So depending sure. on whether or not their marketing department decides they're going to just publish every yeah, piece of Captain Marvel sure. material they've got hanging around, or if they think it'll confuse people to reprint Captain Marvel material that doesn't star Ca- Carol Danvers. It's, it could go either way. And, and, and I'll also uh, bring up uh, the the other uh, legacy Vell that was introduced in the, in Captain Marvel series, which then became a a, a very important fixture of the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy for a while. Phyla uh, was was introduced in uh, in Genesis book, and and she, and she was a a lover of uh, Moon Dragon uh, for for a while there. So that, oh yeah, okay, excellent. Yep. God, Ian, you're giving me chills, man. You're just clutch, <laughs> entry after entry. Hey, you're right in my wheelhouse here. I mean, there's a reason why I chose Legacy. It's like that, the, a lot, so much Legacy was happening in the 90s and 2000s, and that was right when I was like reading like more books than I've probably ever read in my comic reading career. So there we go. Excellent. All right, Ian, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so my number four is Mark Grayson, otherwise known as Invincible. Uh, the character that was created by Robert Kirkman uh, as uh, but not not quite his uh, his Superman analog, but in a way uh, his father was. And that's where the real legacy of it comes here. Uh, his, his father went by the name of Omni-Man. And uh, it I, I will have to give a little bit of a spoiler uh, because, honestly, if you haven't read Invincible, it's barely even a spoiler because the the the, the story itself launches launches itself off of this. Uh Mark Mark gains his powers as a teenager, uh, and his father was essentially waiting for it to happen because he's he's part human and part Viltrumite, the uh, the alien race that uh, that his father uh, hails from. And uh, at at one point, uh, shortly after donning a uh, a super suit, which he got tailored at a at a super suit tailor, which is one of my favorite ancillary characters of the Invincible series, uh, he then has to deal with the fact that his father, Omni-Man, who was the most powerful, most successful, most benevolent hero of this world, then goes and kills uh, their ver- their analog version of the Justice League, and he finds out that his father is not so benevolent after all, that he was actually sent there t- as part of, the, of a Viltrumite uh, force, to try and uh, take over the Earth and uh, make it part of their armada. And uh, and he has two options at this point. Mark can either, you know, go with his dad and be like, hey, cool, I'm a bad guy, or no, what are you doing? You raised me to be this, uh, this, you know, this morals-laden human being, so that's what I'm going to become, and that is what he became, became. And he very much becomes the tentpole hero of this universe uh and uh, mark has grown leaps and bounds over the years he's had so many trials and tribulations throughout the run of the series and actually uh at this point it is very near its conclusion if not already i, I think it's been solicited 
because uh, I know I have the final ultimate collection of Invincible uh, that ready to be pre-ordered uh, whenever that actually does uh, arrive. But uh, it, it's a character that just like got fleshed out so much over the years, and you've seen him grow into being, you know, from being a youngster to actually becoming a a hero that deserves the moniker of Invincible. It, his spirit as, as, is as invincible as his powers. And it, it's, it, he's been one of my favorite characters for years, and uh, he will continue to be so long after his series is no longer being published. Mark's just a, a great, great character. And honestly, to, for me, I like Walking Dead, but this is the series that I turn to as my favorite Robert Kirkman series. Mm-hmm. It, it is Invincible, and it is the character of Mark Grayson himself. I'm glad you chose that because I'm ashamed to say I've only read the first Invincible trade. I, I, you didn't spoil it because I, I knew what I knew that happened with his father, but um, it's a series I've always intended to read because Ian, you've only confirmed what I've heard from so many other people whose opinions I respect that this is one of the best superhero comics that's been produced, uh, you know, in, re- in recent years. Definitely, yeah, and and the the art too is is absolutely stunning. Um, uh, they, they, they go back and forth on the, on the artist, um, I'm blanking on the, uh, on the name of the original artist at the moment. Uh, but I know, uh, Ryan Otley has been drawing it for years now. And, uh, um, it, it, it I, I will say this much though, like it's, it's not for small children, you know, teens and above definitely, because there is some violence in this book that, you know, might be deceiving. Like, you, you might look at the title and see, like, oh, this is a Spider-Man type. And, like, yes, in a way he is, uh, humor-wise, but Robert Kirkman has never been one to shy away from violence, and there are some gruesome, <laughs> gruesome scenes that happen in this series uh, that, that you might want to, you know, that might, you might want to wait until it's age-appropriate for certain people to read. But, uh, yeah, easily, it's, it's a favorite for a reason. All right, bravo. Time for the right, number uh, three round. Go ahead. Yep. All right, Shane, All right. I think you're leading us off this time. So this is going to be my broad pick, but I'll explain that later. I'm going to start with saying it's the JSA and the JLA. That is pretty broad. Yeah, it gets broader. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to go way less broad. Uh, Wally West, the plush. It's quite specific. Chris? Uh, okay, mine is a... How should I put this? It's a 1950s character transplanted in the 1970s. Captain America, commie smasher! <laughs> <laughs> I we were going to say 3D man for a minute there. Yeah. Of course, he's not really a 50s character. but um, My choice is the Black Knight. Nice. Oh, Murd, I should have <laughs> thought of that! Fantastic! <laughs> Beautiful. Well All done. Right. Thank you. All right. So JLA, JSA, you have, to, you have to think of it larger than that. And this also goes for the Avengers, the X-Men, pretty much any team in either Marvel or DC. But specifically with DC's JLA and JSA, you had the JSA in most of my reading history coming before the JLA. And the JLA kind of growing into the role that the JSA had when the JSA was around. And you also had the Infinity Inc. You had All-Star Squadron. Also, many characters in those titles tied to JSA and JLAers that really make these teams in the DC Universe a massive pool of legacy heroes, children or adopted children or foster kids or just people that they helped along and trained to be the good heroes. It's what I've loved, not only because you get more bang for your buck in a team title like Avengers or JLA or X-Men, which I always like. I like being able to see so many characters in one title and various story arcs and characters coming in and out. You also had, as characters would want to go off and do something else, you had new characters introduced and joined these teams. So it was not only legacy for the teams to go through from the beginning of, what was the JSA, like World War I, all the way through to today with not only the team's iterations, but also their children, but also other characters being introduced into the DC Universe or into the Marvel Universe through 
their respective teams because characters retired, characters died off, characters just gave up and wanted to do something else, and you had new characters be able to come in and take those places. So you had many different versions of what a legacy character could be running through all these teams, through both of these companies at all times. And it, it, it's something that I think DC especially does extremely well. I think that's 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 a, a strong backbone to their longevity is their respect to legacy characters and teams. And, and Marvel's done a great job with it too when it comes to X Men, Avengers, and and their various teams. Uh, there's I know there's plenty of offshoots from them, those two teams that have legacy value to them i just don't know them as well as i do the dc stuff so so really my my third pick is really just the legacy that both companies have for their team books and what they allow their team books to bring to the table for any character they want to try out and create from scratch or something they want to bring back from the past or reinvent for whatever new generation they're trying to at a certain time um, it's something I've always enjoyed watching, and, and, and those books are the ones I I follow a lot closer than some other books. Um, uh, my collection is almost what, what I've kept now. What, as, as I dwindle down and sell off things, what I've kept are my massive collections of team books, JLA, JSA, Infinity Inc., All-Star Squadron. Um, I have some X-Men yet and some Avengers runs. Uh, it's it, It's what's near and dear to my heart. Well, Shane, it, that was an outstanding entry. Well done, sir. Definitely. Yeah, and, and it, you you emphasize Shane uh, just a way for the companies to keep things fresh while at the same time remembering the past. I think I think that's what I appreciate the most about it. Yeah. And Shane, that was that was again brilliant because I think you, you captured very nicely uh, just how much DC has utilized legacy often effectively in, 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 in throughout their universe and telling their stories because they have such a rich history to draw upon. And, and, and in the hands of skilled writers, I think they've done that magnificently time after time. So and, well done, sir. And, and with yeah. all that, I can appreciate where they restart the universe every 10 years to satisfy a, a longevity of characters not getting old. But, boy, there's something to be said when they had the older elder statesman JSAers around with the JLA taking on the new heavy burdens and you had smaller offshoot teams that were being trained by the JSA or had direct lineage from the JSA. The Freedom uh, Fighters. Freedom Fighters, um, the Outsiders. In, um, it, it's, it's just so rich. I, I just absolutely love it. And, and to do away with that and make them all their own separate universes is fine in their own earth. And I, and I love that multiverse concept too but boy that that time when when everything had a lineage from beginning to current that was really something special yeah, those few post-crisis jla jsa get together like yeah the, the virtue and vice uh, ogm oh for my example, gosh that's the, still fantastic classic yeah, like, great story absolutely i'm looking forward to the jsa's reintroduction as as we know that that is on the horizon oh, god it's been taking and, so long uh, it's certain mm. it's yeah well, it, it can't happen it can't happen soon enough for me no and you got to include legion too i forgot to mention them you got to include legion of superheroes there's so much that comes to fruition from that book as right. well over the years and the lightning saga yeah really brought oh, that god, yeah. Uh, into clear focus yeah and, Something that the, that that the New Fifty Two got wrong that I feel like Rebirth has gotten way more right. Mm -hmm. I do remember just how much legacy exists in the DC universe. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. All right. So my my number three uh, is uh, a specific DC character, and that is Wally West, the Flash. Now, uh, I I've never been a Barry fan. I, I I just I couldn't get myself around just how personally dull Barry Allen seemed to me um, outside of his death and, and how meaningful it was. In Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is a classic for a reason, mm -hmm. I murdered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Acknowledged um, and appreciated. Yes, uh, very much so. Uh, he died with mm -hmm. purpose and he died for a reason. And it wasn't just to save the DC universe. It was to give wally west the boost that he so deserved and make him the flash and make him the next generation and what was done to wally over the years in in the late 80s and early 90s and late 90s and then even in the 2000s to flesh that character out as much as they did 
was outstanding. Uh, M- Mark Wade created the Speed Force. Uh, he gave uh, him, you know, his, 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 the love of his life and Linda. Uh, eventually, Wally had children and, uh, and crafted a whole Flash legacy for himself. And it, it just, for, for me, this, this was everything that Barry was missing. He had personality. He had humor. He had intelligence, but not so much where, where it seemed like he knew everything. Wally was always constantly learning. And and it, it was displayed no matter who was writing him, but very much so there. And also in uh, in Grant Morrison's JLA, yeah, they came off that way. But uh, he, I don't know, it's just like he, he was a fully fleshed character, and you see that a little bit more now with uh, with New Barry uh, in the uh, in the Rebirth uh, and New Fifty Two DC, at least personally for me. But and I'm extra glad to see Wally back now. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Oh please, yeah. There was a there was a huge hole missing in dc without wally and now we get two of them we get two for the price of one <laughs> i mean come on <laughs> you can't beat that i he's he's a favorite character uh and he always will be and if you have not read mark wade's oh. flash run oh. do yourself a favor so good it, it's, it's fantastic and it, it's so much of what we have now with the flash tv show mm-hmm. you can thank on that run even if it's barry in the in that's mainly in the suit and uh, i've heard i've heard recently it's, it's you know it's that it, i hope it's not a spoiler to say so but uh, i've heard recently that uh we, we we may be having wally moving over to legend of, legends of tomorrow uh join that join that crew to get a little bit more of a of a of a front and center role since he really hasn't had that in uh, in recent uh, flash going on goings on um i just said uh, he, he's my guy Wally's my guy, and I, I both in in comics and in the animated series as well. Mm-hmm. Wally West was just the perfect character for me. If Pants is listening to this, he's fist pumping furiously oh, in agreement gotcha. right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wally is the perfect example of a character going from being a teenage sidekick hero, growing up, falling in love, having, getting married, having kids, and progressing in. Every possible way you could think of, mm. without really restarting him or changing too much along that way, until they plucked him out of time and made him disappear for a while. But he yeah. he has from the time he's a youngster and and he's Kid Flash with Barry all the way through to when he has kids and starts developing their powers. Man, what what an absolute fantastic story of a life mm. in the DC universe. Yes, that's what Ian was saying about constant learning. Yeah. That, 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 oh. that, arc of self-improvement is mm-hmm. definitely in evidence. I mean, like when he first uh, started out as the Flash in his solo series after Crisis, and he was uh, his powers were limited. They were a fraction of what they had been and what they would again become later on. He was actually charging people for his services as a hero. Uh, oh, talk yeah. About your, yeah. <laughs> talk about somebody who has a few lessons to learn about mm-hmm. heroism, but he learned them. Oh, sure. And Absolutely. He learned them in due course over decades worth of really great stories. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, and one of my favorite things about even after uh, Barry came back, if memory serves, they made perfectly clear that Wally was faster. You know, from 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 years of, of, yeah. of using Speed Force and being attuned to it, I'm, I'm almost certain that they made clear that Wally was faster. Yeah, I sort of remember that being addressed in stories. Yep. So, my guy. All right. Um, so I chose Captain America Commie Smasher. Now... <laughs> A little bit of background. So as we all know, um, and I'm sure many listeners know, in the 1950s, they tried to revive Captain America um, when, Mar- when Marvel was roughly considered the, the Atlas era, or as sometimes people say the Atom Age of the 1950s. And uh, they briefly uh, brought back the Submariner, Human Torch, and Captain America, but it didn't last long, although it's noteworthy that a J- John Romita Sr. Uh, penciled some of those Captain America stories. Now, fast forward to what I think is one of Captain America's definitive runs, which is the Steve Englehart run, I think often penciled by Sal Buscema uh, in the Bronze Age, early uh, 1970s. And Englehart did a classic story where he explains how, how is there a Captain America run around the 50s when the, Steve Rogers was you know, chilling in that block of ice. So you know, they, they explain that there was another Cap who was brought – Forward by the government to 
take on the communists in the 50s. They gave him a new, a new Bucky partner. I forgot the name of that character, what his real name was. Jack Monroe. <laughs> uh, I should have known because he becomes a nomad. Awesome. That was silly of me. Thank exactly. you, once, once again, once again, I'm in the foxhole. My last belt of machine gun ammunition. You arrive in the nick of time with the ammo tins. Thank you, sir. Got a bucket of shells so, for you right here, Chris. <laughs> so uh, Engelhardt ex- you know, explains the, the audience you know, how this all happened, and they're classic stories. Because remember, we have, what I love about that era is that Engelhardt is really exploring and challenging the Steve Rogers character and what it means to be Captain America in the time of Vietnam and, and, and Nixon and Watergate, and he uses uh, – the 1950s cap as one of the many uh, factors that are really going to shake Steve essentially to his core uh, in, in in that era, and uh, they're they're classic Bronze Age uh, yarns. I highly recommend them. Um, and uh, Ed Brubaker and his what I consider legendary run on, on Captain America. He also brings that character in as well. The uh, 1950s Captain America. So I, I fortunately don't remember his actual name. William Burnside. Murd, I nice. knew once again. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that he didn't actually have a real name until the Brubaker run you, you just mentioned. I think you're right about that. But it just I, – I love – I mean it, it's, it's sort of a dark reflection in terms of a legacy character. Um, but I just – I love how Engelhart used him to – and then Brubaker later, much later on to sort of challenge what it means to be Captain America, what Captain America is supposed to represent and stand for. And you know it, it challenges you know Steve Steve Rogers' sense of self and, and, and a sense of identity. So not a character who has been used you know to an enormous degree, but uh, when he has been used, I, I think highly effective. So that's my uh, number three. That's, that is an excellent pick, Chris. Probably, Thank you, brother. Probably would have made my list, but uh, I think I'm going to save him for my legacy villains list. Fair enough. Mm. Teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, that's my my turn, I guess. Your turn. All right. Um, uh, uh, my number three is the only Marvel character I have on my on my list. Actually, it's, uh, Shane and I were just discussing uh, before we began recording that uh, you know just uh, so many of our uh, picks were DC, just because the DC universe, for whatever reason, seems to be built or geared more towards uh, the concept of legacy. And once you get past Marvel and DC, you know the legacy heroes are pretty thin on the ground, with uh, rare exceptions like Invincible, if only because a lot of those characters just don't, or those companies even, don't have the kind of accumulated history that's uh, necessary to foster legacy. But the Black Knight is certainly one exception. Now, I can, oh. re- I can remember... Um, but when I first got into reading Marvel comics, and this is going back to the early 90s, the Infinity War and Crusade, etc., those, uh, th- those big deals. Um, it was probably the Infinity War when I first saw the Black Knight in one of the many crowd scenes um, of, the, of the various heroes of the Marvel Universe that gathered together to face uh, the cosmic threat of the Magus. And I saw, amongst all the uh, various spandex types, uh, a person who appeared to be a literal knight in shining armor. And I thought, wow, this is really pretty cool that we're seeing you know, this uh, archetype of heroism represented in the, the ranks of the uh, late 20th century uh, costume champions of, of Marvel Comics. Uh, and he, and I, I endeavored to learn a little more about him. Um, it is just, you know, I, I just got done saying that there's not, uh, or at least there wasn't as of uh, a little while ago. They've gotten more into it recently, as Ian just uh, said uh, near the beginning of the episode. Uh, Marvel hasn't been as into legacy as DC had, but uh, uh, Black... Uh, they, they haven't uh, pursued uh, legacies of individual characters as much as they have uh, legend uh, legacies of mythological traditions. You know, you've seen uh, in the pages of the Avengers and elsewhere in Marvel Comics uh, characters from uh, pre-existing mythological traditions uh, being in- absorbed and incorporated and integrated into the fabric of the Marvel Universe. You've got representatives from the Greek mythology, the uh, Norse mythology, and I guess the token representative of Arthurian myth then would be uh, the Black Knight. Uh, descended as he is, we are told, from a, uh, uh, a member of uh, Arthur's Knight of the Round Table, not as uh, uh, seen in the, uh, the, the tale accumulations of uh, 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 Sir, uh, Sir Geoffrey of Monmouth, I think is the name I'm trying to think of here. Like he, uh, the, Bla- the Black Knight's ancestor is not an authentic Arthurian character. Sir Percy of Scandia is an invention of the comics. Uh, but uh, within the timeline of the Marvel Universe. He was a member of Arthur's Roundtable, and uh, he's a distant ancestor of uh, the modern-day Dane Whitman. 
Um, the interesting thing about Dane Whitman, well, one of a few interesting things about uh, Dane Whitman, the uh, Black Knight who joined the Avengers, is not only that he's a descendant of this actual uh, Arthurian knight, he's also more immediately descended from a supervillain. So he's one of a couple of characters that have, who's uh, trying to cope with not only an, a heroic legacy and an ancient one at that, but a much more recent villainous one. You know, I might as well throw in uh, to what I'd said earlier about Damage and all the heroic legacies he represented, most notably Al Pratt, but he's also the adopted nephew of Dr. Polaris, a longtime DC villain. Hmm. So he had uh, that burden to carry. And Dane Whitman similarly kind of had that to, 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 to dope his way through. He inherited the, the armor and... Uh, and uh, weaponry of the Black Knight from his villainous uncle, Dr. Nathaniel Garrett, who had been a founding member of the Masters of Evil. Uh, but he met an untimely death, and uh, ruining his past actions on his deathbed, he decided to leave everything to his up-and-coming young scientist nephew, Dane Whitman, imploring him to, uh, to v seek redemption for his uncle, you know, just uh, d uh, b uh, scrape the... Uh, uh, the, the barnacles that uh, Garrett had allowed to grow on the legacy, st st stemming back to the days of the round table of the Black Knight. And so we have Dane Whitman trying to uh, sort of uh, cope with uh, the, this uh, villainous legacy he needs to atone for, and also how to uh, how best to embody the Arthurian ideals of chivalry and heroism in the 20th century. And also to balance the fact that uh, he's a... Uh, he's a sorcery and chivalry-themed hero in an age of science, and he is himself a scientist. So he's got uh, this power set that sometimes involves uh, this cursed black ebony blade that was forged by the wizard Merlin himself, uh, and sometimes he's using this uh, like neuron laser sword that he built himself using science. So, and uh, sometimes he, he flies a winged horse, but uh, he has to use his knowledge of genetic engineering to make that winged horse work, you know. I think it was his uncle that created the, the original one that he used, but he needed to you know, tinker with it a little bit to rehabilitate it for the purposes of good. Um, so you got uh, sword and sorcery versus science. You got uh, heroism and villainy. Uh, Dane Whitman's got a lot of balls in the air here. And, uh, he's, uh, and uh, he didn't have an easy time of it in the early 90s when I was reading his adventures for the first time. He was, you know, part of my interest in him was the fact that he was a member of the Avengers team when I started reading that series in the early 90s during the Mike Deodato, Bob Harris days. Um, I stuck with the character when he was shunted off to the Malibu Ultraverse for a while and became a member of Ultra Force. Wow. Uh, yep, if I could stick with uh, that character through that, I must, I, I must think he's something special. <laughs> and so, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, he's, he's an interesting sort of legacy because he's got, well, in, in addition to all the things I've already said, uh, he's, he's basically the stand-in for the entirety of uh, Arthurian mythology in the Marvel Universe. And uh, he's a character that I kind of wish got more play in the, the Marvel Universe nowadays. So, uh, I salute the Black Knight. Any idea? Murdo, go ahead, Ian, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was just, just going to ask, uh, any idea if, that's, if that electric sword he used is the same technology that Cap used for his ion, ion shield? I don't think so. Um, I think that was based on the uh, technology that uh, the U.S. agent used for a while. Uh, he had a photonic shield when he was a member of Forceworks, and I think they adapted that to the uh, sword and shield that Cap used for a time. Murd, I want to salute you, and I'm kicking myself because I've always loved the Black Knight. And that should have been an obvious choice for me, but of course you did a magnificent job going through the character's history like that. Um, always loved the visual of the character. Uh, he had, I think he was a key member of the Avengers during some of the classic Roger Stern stories of uh, the 1980s. A character I always think in the hands of a, a better writers and fleshed out nicely. I know Marvel did a mini series with the character a couple years back, which I did not read. Anybody read that series? No, I did not. Was he a okay. part of the supporting cast of Captain Britain and MI-13? He was. Yes. Oh, that, that series is tremendous. Mm. Oh, Murd. Okay. Uh, <laughs> love that series. Good pick. My pleasure is but to serve, my lady. Jamie liked that series, too. Oh, yeah. He yeah, was well, talking it up constantly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it culminated with a, a fantastic uh, battle with Dracula, where they brought in, like, Blade and um, Hannibal, uh, not Hannibal, not Hannibal uh, King, uh, Peter Wisdom, uh, uh, Spitfire. That, that's a really fun series. That's uh, Paul Cornell wrote that. Right. Heaven Re that, you can find you can find that in bargain bins. It's excellent. Mm. That is uh, one uh, read from the mid to late two thousands that I look forward to reaching in my uh, ever ongoing slog through my reading pile. Uh, how many how many years away do you think that is, oh. Martin? Oh, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> uh, well, I'm only as far as the end of 2003, uh, so probably f- four years worth of comics until we get to that. Probably more. Well, I, lo- I look forward to that when we can discuss it. <laughs> when was uh, when was the Wisdom uh, miniseries? Because uh, that that preceded uh, Captain Britain and MI13. Um. Now you mean Pride and Wisdom, or was there a miniseries of, about just Peter Wisdom? Just Peter Wisdom. That's two, sorry, that was 2006. That's based, that was basically what springboarded into Captain Britain and MI-13. It was a six-issue miniseries, six-issue miniseries you know, oh. about Wisdom, about Pete Wisdom. About Pete Wisdom. I did not read that myself. Okay, okay. That's excellent. That's excellent. Oh, thank you, sir. That's door number two, gentlemen. Uh, Chris, I think it's your turn to go first. All right. Well, I'm gonna. My number two is. It's kind of a no-brainer when I think about it, but I, I think it d- demands a uh, reference. It's Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. Ooh. Who's next? Uh, is that is that, is that you, Mert? Uh, that is you, Ian. Oh, it's me. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, my number two would be Mr. Miles Morales. Hmm. Nice. Excellent choice. Uh, my number two is probably the most murd pick on my list. Duella Dent, the Joker's daughter. Oh, nice. Yes. Wow. My number two is Blue Beetle. Wow, that comes oh. out of left field. You think? <laughs> yes, actually. I, I, I thought it was going to be number one. That's why I'm surprised. Uh, no, I got another one for number one. Mm, all right, we'll just wait and see. <laughs> okay, so... When I was coming up with my list, this is actually the first one I put down. Um, I mean, it, it, when we talk about legacy, what, what I like about this is that Stan Lee was acknowledging the, the Golden Age forerunners of the Marvel Universe. Um, of course, they're going to bring Namor the Submariner uh, directly into the Marvel Universe uh, in Fantastic Four. Um, but... Uh, you know that they didn't they didn't use the android the, the Carl Burgos uh, creation, but they they took the name and the image, and you know that they came up with a whole new character, but one very much in keeping with with you know the powers and and the visual for the most part of, of the original Human Torch, and and I, I mean you know as many people know I'm a, t- a history teacher and I, and I love when you know any kind of artistic world or or, or a fictional world is cognizant of, of its own history so to speak, and. Uh, I appreciate the fact that Marvel did that. Now, granted, if you read about the backstory, like with many of these early Golden Age creators, Carl Burgos was not a happy man when it came to uh, what was done with the Human Torch character and, and you know his, his ownership of that character and so forth. There's a poignant anecdote where I think his daughter revealed how one day she saw her father burning Human Torch comics in the backyard. Um, so that always has to be kept in mind how badly so many of these creators were treated uh, in that work for hire era. Um, but uh, – Johnny Storm, I think, is a, is a great character. I mean, he's, he's a, obviously one of the key members of, of, of the Fantastic Four. He's a character I think has been nicely developed throughout his history. He starts like the G whiz bang, hot rotting, uh, smart Alec uh, younger brother, uh, and you know, they've, they've taken the character on a great journey. Obviously, his, his, his chemistry with the Thing is especially priceless. Um, I have not read the new Marvel Two and One yet. I have to pick that up because I'm, really, I'm looking forward to seeing those two in action uh, once again as they search for uh, Reed and Sue. Uh, but I mean, when I think about legacy characters, this, this is the first one actually that, that came to mind. So it's, it's the Human Torch. Who's next? <laughs> All right. That would be me. Uh, so my number two is Miles Morales. Uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of legacy characters start with, well, you know, he's like a new version of Spider-Man, so I figured I'd put an actual new version of Spider-Man on the list. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Miles, Miles Morales is, is a character that, similar to Kamala Khan, is one that acted as a, you know, I can relate to this character type of character that Marvel introduced. Uh, when Ultimate Spider-Man uh, laid into its run, I believe it was at least 100 issues in, uh, Brian Michael Bendis had the idea to kill off that version of Peter Parker. So that is exactly what he did. And rather than have that be the end of Ultimate Spider-Man, instead, he used it as a springboard to introduce his own version of Spider-Man, and that was Miles. 
Uh, and uh, Miles is a uh, is a teen uh, living in Manhattan uh, who uh, actually Manhattan or Brooklyn. I think it might, might, might actually be Brooklyn now that I think about it. But uh, he uh, goes to a gifted school, which I'm almost certain uh, Sarah Pacelli based on the high school that I went to as a kid. So that gives me extra, you know, reason to enjoy it because it looks a lot like Edward R. Morrow High School. Yeah. Um, and, and he goes to his own gifted, uh, talented high school. With uh, although Morrow did not have dorms, so he had that over over the real Morrow. Um, but he lives there with his best friend Genki and a whole bunch of other uh, characters and whatnot. Uh, his uncle uh, was the ultimate version of the Prowler, and uh, one of which that never actually had the heroic redemption that the main universe version of Prowler had. So he had that to deal with. Uh, and his father also had a uh, tumultuous past as well uh, that got fleshed out. Uh, but, you know, obviously uh, he was no longer a criminal by the time uh, Miles was born. Um, his, his mother is also there. And, and that's the, the main difference uh, for Miles, at least for a while, was that he had both parents in his life. And, and that, that's what made him unique to me as a Spider-Man character. But out of a sense of duty and as of a sense of, out of a sense of wanting to continue the legacy that Peter put forth, he dons the spider suit because he gets bit by another radioactive spider, one of the other ones that was let loose from Norman Osborn's experiment, which gave the ultimate version of Peter his powers to begin with. And because it's a different spider... His powers are slightly different than Peter's, which made him unique. Uh, he has a stealth ability that Peter never had. Uh, he can he actually has stingers that he can launch uh, to try and uh, and stun uh, people as well. And uh, once he put on the costume and eventually you know got his own costume, he actually got the web shooters that Peter left behind from Aunt May. Uh, the sort of because Aunt, Aunt May was perfectly okay with someone taking on the legacy because she wanted someone to honor her her fallen uh, uh, nephew. So that's exactly what Miles did, and he crafted a legacy for himself as the Spider Man of the Ultimate Universe. And after the events of Secret Wars, he wound up in the main Marvel Universe, and and for a while now he has been the main Spider Man title. The one without amazing on it, the one that just the adjectiveless Spider-Man has been Miles' adventures. And I'm a little bit worried because uh, I, I've heard some things that they might be changing his name to something other than Spider-Man. And I, I don't want that, honestly, uh, because one thing that we've learned in D.C. is that there can be plenty, there can be multiple Green Lanterns running around. Why can't there be multiple Spider-Mans? Miles is Spider-Man to me as much as Peter is Spider-Man. And I hope that Marvel does not do anything negative to the character, especially now that his guardian, Brian Michael Bendis, is no longer with the company. Hmm. So I'll have to see on that. Um, but I, I've enjoyed a lot of what Miles has brought to the character. He rejuvenated youth into the character of Spider-Man that had not been there for quite some time without having to say uh, he was never married. So that, that was a bonus. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just I... Another one of those characters where it's in, even in his interaction with Kamala Khan in Champions, he's grown uh, personality-wise, leaps and bounds, and uh, continues to learn and make himself as formidable a hero as, as his legacy would uh, would suggest. So, Miles Morales deserves my uh, respect as my number two. And Ian, I concur that I hope they don't change the name. That, that's... Because I've not, I haven't read as nearly as many of his Miles Morales adventures as you have, but the ones I've read I've really enjoyed, and I think I think the way that the characters were developed, he's more than earned the right to be referred to as Spider Man. So, yeah. I, and I haven't read yet. I have it on my nightstand, um, the Spider Man Volume Two. Have you read that? I have. Any series? Yeah. Okay. It, it's waiting to be read. I I, I actually uh, got the digital copies, and are, and are, and, are, and, and that's next on my list once I get through a couple other things that I need to get through. All right. Well, maybe we'll discuss that down the road. Definitely. All right, gentlemen, proceed. All right. So, Duella Dent, the Joker's daughter. All right, so talk about your little Bronze Age anomalies that I've uh, grown fond of. Yeah. Uh, she, she first popped up as uh, a villain 
a mysterious figure um, in the the Batman family anthology series as a, an opponent for both Robin and Batgirl. Sure. Um, so she was, appeared first as the Joker's daughter, and then in pretty rapid succession. Like he, she uh, then showed up, calling herself the Penguin's daughter, the Riddler's daughter, Catwoman's daughter, the Scarecrow's daughter. Uh, she's just. <laughs> She's everybody's daughter. They're just kind of passing her around. Uh, although she did stick to the Joker uh, ruse more often than not. Um, eventually, she was revealed more or less definitively, or as definitively as it got in this character's case, as actually being the biological daughter of Two-Face, hence her name, Duella Dent. You know, it says that her given name reflecting uh, Two-Face's fascination with duality. Um, and uh, she, in a mystifying turn, you know, I've... I, I would love to read, and I'm, going, I'm making it a point to read eventually, um, the issues in which this happens, but she decides to turn over a new leaf at some point, almost arbitrarily, I get the feeling, and just kind of decides, hey, you know what, maybe I'll be a hero now. And uh, so she actually joins the Teen Titans. This character was a member of the Teen Titans during their the, the very last iteration of that team in the late 70s uh, before... Uh, uh, the, the, the Wolfman Perez uh, reboot of the new Teen Titans came along in 1980. So for a while there, she, uh, under the name of the Harlequin, you know, just a, a little less unwieldy than the Joker's daughter, I guess, um, she, she joins up with the team uh, and a bunch of stories there. She Actually, she, she had a headshot appearing on the front cover of all those issues of uh, Teen Titans uh, right above uh, the, of the title. Um, and uh, that was the last you saw of her for a little while. She uh, popped up, you know, like a deranged clown in a jack-in-the-box for uh, several times over the following years. Um, and uh, she showed up at the wedding of uh, Donna Troy and Terry Long, as I recall. And uh, uh, Dick Grayson, ever the detective, points out to her, say, it's occurred to me that you're too old to be Two-Face's daughter. And she's like, ha! I'm amazed it took you this long to figure that out. So <laughs> the mystery is preserved. The mystique is still there. And, and so she continued to pop up over the next couple of decades, usually in, uh, sometimes in bat context, but more often in Titans context. And she was a member of the team for a while and so became a part of its uh, eternally uh, referenced history. Um, but, and then she continued this shtick of uh, claiming to be uh, different people's daughters, even like Doomsday's daughter or Wildebeest's yeah. daughter. So, I yeah. did that about Tuesday's story. Yeah. To, well, no, she didn't expect anybody to believe her at that right. point. But, you know, it's, to paraphrase her favorite fake father figure, if she's going to have a legacy, she'd prefer it to be multiple choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the shtick of being everybody's daughter was kind of her thing. And uh, it was also kind of her thing to uh, accumulate different uh, backstories and uh, explanatory origins. Um, you know, just uh, on the metatextual level, it's, it's, it seems like all the different writers uh, who uh, used her in latter years uh, sort of came to be in on the joke. Like uh, for a little bit there, it seemed as if she was going to get a different an origin explaining her presence in the DC universe via the Team Titans series, which is a bunch of characters from the future. I think they, they dangled a little hint in the uh, next issue box of the last issue of that series. That's a joke more than anything else, that uh, the next issue, which was never going to be published, would feature the return of the Harlequin, who's got a reality-altering device that plunges New York back into the 70s. <laughs> that was the first time I ever heard of the character, actually, is in that little next issue. It was a, a zero-hour crossover. Um, uh, so I, I think that the writers of that series, though, actually did have plans to use her eventually. So that never played out. Um, I think around the time of uh, the countdown to Final Crisis, uh, it was suggested that she was uh, actually a refugee from Earth-3 and was actually the daughter of that version of Earth's Joker and Two-Face, since uh, Two-Face is actually a female heroic character oh, named right. uh, yeah. Three-Face, uh, Evelyn Dent, you know, Three Faces of Eve, as in. Um, so that, that, there's another possible origin for her that uh, was introduced and, uh, well, didn't stick any more than that version of reality or that multiverse stuck. I mean, this is the post-crisis, post-infinite uh, crisis new multiverse, which now, you know, post-Flashpoint no longer exists. So, right. And now the Joker's daughter's running around again, uh, uh, a little more overtly villainous this time, though. You may know that she's uh, been seen wearing the Joker's severed face as a mask. Yeah. So, yeah, you, <laughs> yet another take on this ever mercurial character. And then that, that mercuria, mercuriality, we'll say that's the substantive form, uh, is, <laughs> is just what I like most about the character. You know, 
talk, talk about somebody who takes legacy to odd new extremes, and also talk about somebody who's a great uh, manifestation of the trickster archetype. You know, as I've, I've mentioned a few times on the show before, I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis at Penn State on the subject of the uh, trick, the mythical trickster, and uh, how it's used, you know, the many different forms it's taken in uh, the modern day myth of superhero comics. As a matter of fact, uh, Chris uh, is uh, currently in possession of uh, my hard copy of that thesis. I am indeed, sir. I am indeed. And I've actually, I wanted to mention to you that I've begun reading it. Excellent. Chris, you've made me yes. a very happy man. I'd love to hear what you think about it. But I do apologize. We'll I apologize to you and to myself, though, Chris, that the Joker's daughter is not mentioned in that thesis. Because when I wrote it, I really wasn't that familiar with the character. But now that I am, now that I see just... <laughs> <laughs> what, what a figure of, of chaos and constant change and innovation she is. She's a very liminal figure, constantly dancing on the razor's edge between the Manichaean black and white moral extremes that are <laughs> comic book heroism and villainy. Like she, for no discernible reason, she seems to decide at one time, ah, I'm going to operate as a villain. Then at another time, eh, I feel more like a villain, to, uh, like a hero today. You know, just to her latter appearances as a part of, like, a, I think she was a part of a, a villainous group of uh, titans uh, it, at a point uh, to, to which I'm not read up, of course, so I, I can't say for sure. But I, uh, she, she just she, she just kind of flies in the face of uh, the whole idea of uh, legacy in comics, which was nascent at the time she first appeared in 76, and also of the, the, just the somewhat arbitrary definitions of heroism and villainy as well. She's just a great trickster figure, even an even more perfect example of tricksterism than her uh, alleged father, the Joker. And I, I could have... I, I can see a couple of great paragraphs I could have added to that, the that thesis if I'd only known a little bit more about Duella Dent, if that's her real name, <laughs> at that time. So yeah, she, she's a character that I love to see popping up in the comics because you know enjoyable, chaotic storytelling is going to follow in her wake. I wasn't all that happy with her just being some random psychopath who wears the Joker's face as a mask, but mm. but I bought it. The, I bought uh, the, the the issue where she first appeared. I think it was part of the Forever Evil event, actually. I believe so. But yeah, I bought it anyway, just because I, as I said, whatever form this uh, highly sort of protean figure takes, it, it's bound to be colorful fun, even if it also involves you know dismemberment and yeah. blood and awfulness. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought. I, I was sort of going around with myself whether I should save her for the villain list or put her in the hero list. Um, but, you know, thinking of it, she's uh, been acting heroic in at least half of the appearances she's made to date. So she's, yeah. I think she's as much uh, a villain as a, a hero. She, she, she's got as much business being classified as a hero as a villain, at least. And uh, since uh, she, her presence in a list of heroes is arguably more disruptive, I think that's probably what she as the pedigree trickster she is would uh, prefer. So, this, uh, <laughs> the last of many legacies, Duella Dent, is my number two. And she came darn close to being my number one. Yeah. <laughs> In my head, she has a list and a 20-sided die. And she rolls it <laughs> and decides which one she's going to be the daughter of that day. <laughs> she's probably mm -hmm. got a special like leather pouch that she keeps it in, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, my number two, Blue Beetle. Um, I've loved this character since I first read Ted Cord as the Blue Beetle in Justice League from 1990, 1987. 86, 87, good heavens, my memory's faltering me. Um, it was then DC's cleverness over time to retcon in Dan Garrett as a previous Blue Beetle and Jaime Reyes as a future Blue Beetle, but to now have Ted Cord and Jaime Reyes teaming up in the new Blue Beetle um, has sent me over the moon. It's something I've been hoping for for years. Uh, the only thing that would be better than that would be if uh, Booster and Beetle ever got their Brave and the Bold comic book that I think they should so richly be able to play around in. And who would you like to see uh, uh, write and draw that book? <sighs> oh, boy, I don't know. Dan Jurgens would, would be first. First in my head, um, mostly because he's so active yet and has done so much with Booster Gold that if they did a, a Brave in the Bold like that, I wouldn't mind seeing him take the reins for a while first. Sure. Don't you mean Brave in the Gold? Well, that would work too. <laughs> I always want Brave in the Bold just so it's uh, more legacy to the book than anything yeah. else. The cover of the first issue would have Booster painting a G over the B <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, I think this character has been so much fun to watch. They, they've they've portrayed him as goofy, and and he comes and goes with that over time. He's been serious when he was uh, backing the Birds of Prey a little bit, not even as Blue Beetle, just as Ted Cord uh, when he was having heart problems. He's more serious now mentoring Jaime Reyes since he has medical problems in the current Rebirth series. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun to see them play around with Blue Beetle, and I'm so happy that they've brought Ted Cord back into reality uh, of the DC Universe rather than just have him be deceased and um, not in anything other than uh, some crazy time twist story or some make-believe thing that happens. Um, it, he's Blue Beetle, Ted Cord, and ancillary blue beetles are, are in my top five of characters of all time. Uh, it, it, there's a, an affinity I have for the character that just never goes away and never dies. And some of that's because he is a little bit of Batman in the technology he can create. He's a little bit the detective as well, but he's also more of an every man where he becomes overweight. He becomes out of shape. Mm -hmm. He, gives up being a hero for a while. He has medical problems. It's, it's something that most other characters don't go through. And they've, right. they've allowed some, some reality to set into Ted Cord as a character. Um, and, and I always appreciated that. It, it, it made me feel as I've grown older and gotten a little bit out of shape, more normal. Um, <laughs> and, and it was nice to see that reflected in some mm -hmm. character. Yep, see, so uh, there's at least one superhero oh, who God, knows yeah. what we're going through. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Shane, I've, Shane, I've never asked you this. How did you react to his death in Countdown? Oh, uh, it, it was extremely poignant for the story because during that time, he was really trying to get to everybody he trusted – whether it be Martian Manhunter or Booster Gold or even Batman, and say, look, something is going on, and everybody he turned to kind of blowed him off as some joke, as some, um, uh, well, it's just Ted Cord being paranoid. It's, it's, it's fine. It's not going to be a big deal. And here it was a big deal, and, and it was met with the most disastrous of results that are possible. Um, it, it made that, that next issue, whatever came after Countdown, where everyone realized just how right he was, so powerful and yet so sad, um, that it, it turned everybody's head around to, yeah, he was Ted Cord, yeah, he was a little bit eccentric, and, and they were goofy with the schemes he and Booster did, but here's this guy that really did figure out everything that was going on and tried to warn us, and we failed him. Um, so it, it really gave him a lot of weight at that time, even though I terribly missed the character being in the universe, it, 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 it really helps solidify the next few years of stories in, in my mind for DC. So for you, it served the story and served the character then in that sense. It, it absolutely did. Um, but I'm a thousand times happier. They've brought him back in a way. Hmm. And, and how was the him. justice league future story they did recently with him and Booster oh. Gold? I didn't read that. Oh, that was, it was well, <laughs> anything, anything that I, I think that justice league 3000, 3001 title was fantastic. And then to have them come back into the Blue Beetle title and play around with Ted and Jaime, um, I, I thought it was fantastic. I really enjoyed those couple issues. You, you, you remind me, talking about Countdown, that uh, back when I was in college, college. before I even had a podcast, uh, the very first interview that I did with, uh, with a professional – was with Phil Jimenez because oh, nice. I because I, I was <clears throat> I was doing this uh, piece for my uh, for my college uh, radio uh, class and uh, it was about comic books not being for kids anymore and I, I remember Phil essentially saying along the lines of what, of what you said uh, when it came to Countdown that uh, you know it, it served the story that you know it, it might it might not have been what fans of the character may have wanted to see happen but it, it was very much a respectful way for it to happen and then the ramifications of it are what mattered the most and it, it really showed just how evil uh max lord max was lord and what they were going to do with him from that point forward yeah definitely gentlemen i have a request unfortunately i have the departure list so we do our number ones do you mind if i go first no that's fine that's fine and shane i will not steal your thunder because you've been absolutely <laughs> on fire in this episode so, 
But uh, let's do our, our uh, initial announcements. So uh, my number one is Jack Knight Starman. All right. Uh, my number one is surprising probably very few people, Mr. Kyle Rayner. That doesn't surprise me, no. <laughs> um, so uh, partnering up and pigging piggybacking on your uh your number one pick uh, ian my number one is connor hawk oh nice, nice. Uh, and mine is jack knight starman or it's starman as a whole <laughs> all right so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave most of this for shane this reminds me uh some years ago when we did our our top five uh star wars movie moments and uh, we made sure murd got his cantina uh <laughs> scene to expound <laughs> upon at length so that's what i like about this group of guys we look after each that's other that's right we do <laughs> hell yeah so uh, all i'll say just in brief is that when it comes to the notion of legacy, I can I consider this the greatest legacy character in comics. Um, I think James Robinson and the artists working with him, uh, Tony Harris uh, was was the initial artist, of course. What they achieved in that book, I mean, for me, that is one of the greatest finite series in the history of the American comic book. I, I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I, I stand by it. I, I I think that series is essentially perfect, um, and I think no series had a better grasp of the history, and when, and I'll leave a lot of this to shame. When you just think about how he addressed, meaning Robinson, every facet of the Starman character and the various incarnations throughout from the Golden Age all the way through that, that Jack Knight title. Nothing was left behind. And even in the future. Yeah, exactly, and – it, it, it's it's an incredible storytelling achievement um, in the history of, of the medium, and uh, it's it's a series I hope that Shane and I can I, I'd love to, for us to kind of go through the whole thing down the road and talk about the entire series in a lot more depth um, because I, I think it deserves that treatment because frankly I, I think it's a masterpiece. Yeah, so, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, and Shane, I'll leave you to go on go into it in, in much more detail, but uh, that's my number one. I apologize, brethren, that I have to depart. There's a Family matters to attend to. Uh, before you but, go, uh, Chris, do you have any alternates? The only alternate I had, Murd, and I, I, I don't know if this is exactly legacy, but I'll shoehorn it in because it, it, it's it's such a great character. Is the Vision? Hmm. Um, I mean, you think about. I think his name was Arcus, the, the Golden Age. Spot Vision. on, Chris. Very good. Yeah, it was Smoke World? I think it came from or something like that, and. Uh, you know, kind of a more minor Golden Age Marvel character. I think Carl Burgos created him too, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, Roy Thomas, as he often does, plucked that name <laughs> and that sort of that visual concept uh, from the Golden Age and, you know, co created, I think, which is one of, one of the most compelling Marvel characters. Um, and still, one of the, one of, I think, one of, the, one of the most interesting of the Avengers. So that, that's the one alternate I, I had in mind. So. Gentlemen, I will leave you to it. Ian, always an absolute pleasure to have you on the program, sir. My pleasure to talk to you, Chris. Yes, thank you so much. It's a wonderful idea. And I, I look forward to having you back. We can do, uh, at some point down the road, top five legacy villains. Sounds like a plan. So, uh, Brethren, I will be in touch soon to discuss uh, future programs. Take care, Chris. All right. Good night, brothers. Take care now. Carry on, All sir. Right. Bon voyage. All righty. Good night. Okay, so here we are with uh, my number one, who uh, anybody who's ever listened to me talk on a podcast ever shouldn't be too surprised that I went with Kyle Rayner here. Good old Mr. Uh, Crab Mask. Yes. Oh, my God. Crab Mask and all, man. Uh, and mind you, the Crab Mask is back now. Like, they, they went everywhere with that character's <laughs> costume. Did. And and they somehow, like, in, in current Rebirth, decided, hey, let's go back to the old one. Like, all right, fine. <laughs> if you want an oversized crab mask, go right ahead. But Kyle Rayner, for me, is the epitome of the Green Lantern because what he has over others who have had that title is he's an artist. He's literally a creative. So every single... Uh, you know, manifestation of the ring that he's going to have is going to be something that he is putting time and effort into. And sometimes even on a whim, he's just like, all right, this, this would look really cool. I'm going to go ahead and have like a, a bear with a bot with, uh, with, you know, with boxing gloves on to try and, you know, punch out this, this villain who I'm dealing with right now. And even with the, 
the '90s tragedy of his of his behind his character. You know, mm-hmm. the literal woman in refrigerator, which started that entire meme. Uh, started with Kyle Rayner because his 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 girlfriend winds up stuffed in a refrigerator, and that gives him you know further inspiration to continue being a hero, which frankly I still think is ridiculous, but whatever. He's he's long since grown past that, and uh, and for me uh, is one of the stronger Green Lanterns. My same problem that I had with with Barry is what I had with Hal for a while. There is that he just never really struck me as a very uh, likable nor well rounded character, mm. and I feel like we got that a lot more with with Kyle through his interactions with with Wally and with Connor in the '90s and with the Justice League and all that jazz. It certainly helped flesh that out and even further past that with the green lantern Corps title where he was a central member of that along with john stewart and guy gardner yeah. um easily one of my favorite titles of of the of the time was peter tomasi's uh, green lantern Corps title and uh, anyone who has not checked that out uh, either do so digitally or, or via trade and you will not be disappointed i mean uh, tomasi's knocking it out of the park now with the uh, with the superman books but for years he was working on the uh, green lantern titles and did a terrific job of building that up and uh kyle rayner restarted the core in a lot of ways Uh, they 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 built it down and he built it back up Uh, even even when he tried unsuccessfully to try and you know make it happen uh eventually it it stuck and you know it's it's him as ion which then essentially restarted the entire core and built it back up from nothing uh, he was the only Green Lantern. Now he's one of many again, but he still shines as one of their strongest for me, and uh, it's it's why he's there for for my number one. And uh, he's he's going to be a character that I'm going to love whether whether I'm not, I'm reading him monthly or not. He's going to be a character that I love for for years and years and years, and nothing's really going to change that for me. And I am glad that the character has uh, survived all this time. Yeah, yeah, me too. Goodness knows, DC would have close calls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, DC had plenty of opportunities to sweep him under the rug many times, yeah, but sure never did. took them. Yeah, and uh, I, I look forward to reading him in Omega Men, by the way, because uh, I, I know that uh, Tom King's uh, Omega Men was underappreciated, and uh, it's the title that I look forward to getting either digitally or, or in trade sometime soon to read some of his most recent adventures before this uh, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps title started up. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta say, Kyle Rayner. You know, I, I read, I collected his. Ent- after Ron Mars came in and uh, re- rebooted everything, the whole Emerald Twilight thing happened, and Hal went mad, became Parallax, and uh, Kyle was thrust center stage. I, I mean, that that was when I got started with DC Comics. I, rem- I had remembered seeing like the Green Lantern on Super Friends, and I thought, oh, they're doing something, you know, uh, Death of Superman level with that character. Maybe I'll. Just to check in, and I, I fell in love with Hal and with the, the power and potential of his ring, just from that one little three-issue storyline. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just, I kind of fell in love with the idea, you might say, of a character that I barely knew right there. And so when uh, Kyle, did, Hal was kind of a tough act to follow in my young mind. I mean, I, I kind of put Hal on a pedestal instantly, and I was like, okay, you know, here's this replacement kid. Here's the scab Green Lantern, the scab in a crab. And I, (laughs) so Kyle didn't exactly get off on the best foot with me. I I still collected the Green Lantern series for years after that. Um, But it it wasn't so much for Kyle as it was because I was following the Green Lantern ring. And I I liked the powers more than I liked the person wielding them at first anyway. And Kyle, he did, he kind of tried my patience for a while there just because he he had a tendency to be kind of... uh, I don't know, brash and hot-headed and uh, to kind of bumble through uh, the routine of being a superhero, which is understandable, really, because he just had this vastly powerful cosmic weapon dropped in his lap without any uh, instructions or any buy-your-leave from the guard, from Ganthet. And, uh, but, but he still, you know, all things considered, does a pretty good job of uh, fitting himself into this uh, intergalactic legacy of heroism, you know, even going so far as eventually uh, becoming... Uh, a god in it when he, during the, the period of time when he wielded the power of Ion. Yeah. And, well, so in time, I, I grew to appreciate Kyle and uh, give him a, a fair shake, especially when I gradually came to learn that he really 
in some ways was a better character, as you said, Ian, than Hal Jordan was. I mean, I was accusing Hal, I mean, Kyle of being, you know, hot-headed and kind of a bumbler when I didn't realize at that time just how hot-headed Hal very often was during the 60s and 70s and, <laughs> yeah, and how is. often he didn't have his life together either. Yep. Uh, so, uh, and then Jeff Johns brought him back, and uh, to be perfectly honest, I found him kind of dull at that point. So I, I didn't realize just how good we all had it with Kyle, actually. And uh, uh, my, my last word on the subject of your number one pick here, Ian, is uh, what uh, Daniel, Dream of the Endless, once told Kyle during uh, Grant Morrison's run on the JLA, was that he was going to surpass Hal Jordan. And, Ky- and Kyle just was like, what are, you, are you kidding me? Hal Jordan's the man, the legend, known throughout uh, many galaxies as the greatest Green Lantern ever. What do I have that he, that he didn't have? And Dream just tells him, fear, you will surpass him. Hmm. There it is. That's, yeah. Expanding on that, uh, what he also had was uh, more fully developed humanity. So, yeah. enough said. So, which, I, which is which is funny considering that you know without the weakness to yellow, which through retconning was in itself impurity and fear itself. It's it, it's it's interesting to, to hear those words because. He, I think it was, it was that he had fear, but he didn't let it get to him. Yeah. And eventually, when they rein, reinstated the yellow impurity, that was kind of the rule behind it. You know, like it's uh, the, the the yellow impurity only exists until the Green Lantern wielding the ring has conquered his or her or its inner fears. Yep. Yeah. But funny enough, Murd, my one of my first issues that I that I remember buying of Green Lantern was Green Lantern number one hundred, which had Hal Jordan time traveling yep. and teaming up with with Kyle, and then he was in the book for a while. And I guess my, my, my childhood brain could have gone one of two ways. It could have been like, oh, hey, cool. Here's the original how, you know, the, re, the original Green Lantern. I'm, I'm going to, you know, really get to know him and like him better than this replacement who's been in the book for forever. And, hey, this is my first exposure to him. But I went the other way. Hmm. And I am, I'm kind of glad I did in the, in the long run. I'm kind of glad I did. Hmm. I remember that. It was like a six-part story. Yep, six parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember enjoying that very much. I do too. But uh, I also remember not being too sad when Hal skipped afterwards. Yeah. And Judd Winnick's run on the on the, uh, on the Kyle Rayner oh, character. Yeah, well, that was great. Amazing. Fantastic. All right, so let's uh, move on then to my number one pick here, uh, you know, uh, the other half of the hard-traveling heroes, the next generation, the Connor Hawk Green Arrow, son yes. of the original. And, you know, and I said uh, earlier on in this episode that we're not, uh, we, we don't stand too much on rankings. You know, the, the you know, number five versus number one doesn't mean that much uh, the way we do these lists. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't sure which of the few characters I'd uh, sort of bracketed for inclusion in my top five list I was going to make number one. It was uh, kind of an arbitrary choice. But in the end, what uh, drove Connor Hawk to the top of the list was, well, it ties back into what we've been saying since the beginning of the episode, Ian, about what, what you uh, mentioned, uh, how uh, prevalent uh, legacy heroes or replacement heroes in well-established heroic roles were in the 90s as Marvel and DC were trying to refresh their brands a bit, as you put it. Um, and how these uh, replacement heroes were kind of the vogue between you know, Wally, Kyle, Connor, Asbats even, yeah. and uh, over on the Marvel side, people like U.S. Agent, Thunderstrike, and so forth. Um, so the reason I decided to go with uh, Connor Hawk as the number one on my list of legacy heroes was that because I was a child of the 90s, as you were, Ian, that is when I cut my teeth in comics reading as well, uh, when all of these uh, legacy heroes were cropping up. And of that crop of legacy heroes that I remember so well, Connor Hawk was the only one that I can say I actually liked better at that time anyway than the character he was replacing. You know, mm-hmm. as, as I said, uh, Kyle did eventually grow on me, but at first, yeah. Uh, but Connor, you know, I thought I liked him. I thought his personality was way better from his dad from the get-go. And again, I didn't really know the Ollie of the Bronze Age you know, when he first developed his liberal social conscience. Mm-hmm. But I think I probably would have found him a little annoying uh, even back then. Uh, just a little too outspoken and, and brash. Um, Connor was the exact opposite of his father. You know, he was uh, soft-spoken, you know, quiet, a little naive as to the ways of the world, having sp- spent his entire childhood growing up in a monastery. Sure. And uh, unlike most of the other legacy heroes that were popping up, he was, you know, he, he was a blood relation of the hero he was replacing. He, he was a father to son passing on of a mantle. 
uh, which is something you weren't seeing that much in comics at that point. Mm-hmm. Although it had happened once or twice in the past, obviously, but of, of this generation of readership we're talking about, of which Ian and I, to which Ian and I belonged. Uh, and so I just... I, I just liked the guy. That's all there was to it. I mean, he he, uh, he was a great counterpoint to his father for the uh, few adventures when they were actually able to, you know, to, uh, act together as, as a father and son hero team. And then his father's untimely death. And uh, Connor was able to take over as written by Chuck Dixon. And, well, I, I was cheering Connor on every step of the way when he had his first uh, team up with uh, with Kyle and uh, eventually with Kyle and Wally. There was three of a kind, I think. was yep. It was a three-part story. I sure think it was. involved... Uh, Heat Wave and some other villain on a cruise ship, as I recall. Yep. <laughs> uh, and uh, then his membership ultimately in the JLA. Mm-hmm. In this, I, I was cheering for him. He, he was just a, he was a really nice, mild mannered guy. You know, just a, you know, what Chris, what, what we've been saying a while ago about Tim Drake being a very grounded Robin. Well, yeah. uh, Connor Hawk was a very centered Green Arrow. You know, borrowing some uh, spiritual like yoga terminology. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you know, he, having grown up in an ashram, he uh, you know, that that was kind of his thing. He, he was at, at peace with the world around him, and uh, he wasn't quite the angry soul that his no, father no, was. No, and, no. and by that point, Ollie Queen was pretty darn bitter. Yeah. he'd been through some shit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, Connor, and you know, just as you were kind of uh, biting your fingernails about Kyle at, at times, Ian, you know, hoping against hope and uh, being. Uh, justified in your hope, as it turned out, that Kyle would not get uh, written out or killed off or whatever. I was hoping the same thing for Connor for years. And sure enough, uh, he continued to be a presence in Green Arrow's life, and he continued to use the Green Arrow moniker. Mm -hmm. Now, just to to fuel your argument, Ian, that there's no need to let Miles Morales be called anything but Spider-Man. He was one of two Green Arrows in the DCU for a while. And ultimately, I'm sorry to say DC caved in, chose the... uh, less honorable path, and uh, just allowed Connor Hawk to be put on ice just for the sake of some cheap tragedy in the lives of Green Arrow and, uh, and his partner Black Canary. Uh, so at least they didn't kill him. I mean, they, 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 they put him into a coma, they put him on ice, and then, of course, yeah, I don't think he was ever gotten out of uh, continuity cold storage, as it were, out of limbo yeah. uh, before Flashpoint hit and his entire existence was pretty much overwritten. So yeah. He is a character that I would kind of like to see again. Sure. And, you know, again, uh, talking of... Uh, of the, the uh, introduction of the, these characters uh, for the sake of uh, diversity and uh, additional representation, I mean, he was, I'm pretty sure, half black. So that would be an excellent character for DC to maybe get out of mothballs here in this brave new world of superheroes that we're now living in. So one can only hope. So Connor Hawk has, uh, uh, whom I regarded at the time and in a way still do, as the finest of his generation of legacy heroes which was you know, the first generation of comic books, period, that I ever read, uh, that I reserved the top spot for him on my list. I really enjoyed his, his stint with the JLA and his partnerships with um, Kyle and Wally. I thought that they wrote those three characters together very well mm-hmm. in, in all the adventures they had. Yep. And what I said about him being a good counterpoint for his yeah. father's hot-headedness, yep. he was equally strong as a counterpoint to Kyle's. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he was someone that I related to in that as much as I would get upset or frustrated at things and we all know the the video game controller story very well um i liked that he was written to be centered and calm above all yeah. else to try and pull everyone together and work together and be better together helping each other than even separately i it, i just i really appreciated the way that they wrote that in there in for him and uh, he was he was a quarter Korean, a quarter African American, and a quarter Cor- and, and half Cor- Caucasian. That was okay. that was kind of fun. okay. So it was his mother Moon Day Hawk, who was half black and half Korean. Mm-hmm. You got it. Makes yep. sense. Yeah, and uh, Connor. Yeah, Connor was absolutely the complete opposite of of the man uh, his his father was for quite some time. And that one issue of Justice League, where it's him alone mm-hmm. in the Watchtower. Yep, I think it's. I want to say number four. He's battling the key. Yes, it was yeah. shortly after the first arc with the Hyper Clan, yeah. and, and that uh, was only yeah, that was the first three issues. So I'm, and I'm, he's got nothing but some of his dad's old trick arrows oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to fight off this this powerful villain. It's like that dad. told me that told me what type of character he was, and I absolutely adored it. Stalking around with that boxing glove arrow uh-huh. cocked, he's like, Dad, oh, <laughs> Dad, yeah. you're gonna be the death of me yet. <laughs> Just one pointed arrow, Dad. <laughs> And I, I appreciated that uh, uh, both Kevin Smith and 
and and Brad Meltzer kept him around mm-hmm. yeah. during during yeah. the Green Hour run, you know, because he could have been written off way earlier than he was. Right. Um, it, and uh, and that was not the case. He became a very good supporting character, yeah, just along the, the same lines as what Arsenal was for the for the for the title. And uh, they really did become an Arrow family, the same way that Flash had a family. Yeah, in the same way the Bat Universe had a family. Definitely. Yeah, that was that was that God. That Green Arrow run was really well done. Absolutely. All right, Rhapsodize Starman is about Starman. Starman. So many many people out there know that Starman is one of my favorite characters um, for many reasons, not the least of which is the father son connection, not only to Jack's father Ted, but also what happens later. I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it because I I agree with Chris in that I think it is one of, if not the finest example of a complete story. It's what, 81 issues long, um, I think. And uh, it just does such a fantastic story. James Robinson just goes above and beyond anything I could have ever imagined the way he wrote and intertwined that story with so many things that he started in the beginning in that first sins of sins of the father story arc that really went through to fruition through the entire story, through the entire series. Um, I actually just started before we decided to do this uh, episode, I started to reread Starman because it's been too long and I've never gotten to reread the entire thing. I always get kind of mired down in the middle of it and go to something else and then try to get back to it. And then, well, where did I finish? So then I start over. So I'm really trying to make an effort to go through the entire series now again. Um, I read the first story arc uh, last weekend or the week before and have to pick up the next one from there. I hope you stick to it. Oh, I do too. My advice, God. just do an issue a day, just a little bite. Well, and that's something that I'm, I'm trying to do. Uh, uh, total sidebar here. As, as much as you're behind 15 years, I'm not near quite that far behind you. I reading. hope not, Shane. I hope um, no one is. <laughs> but, but I am behind. And it's ridiculous to me that I get between 25 and 30 titles a month, and I can't just find the time to read one book a day. I could read the entire order in a month if I just sat down once a day. So no matter what happens the last three weeks, sometime during the day or evening at night, I go and read at least one book just to be able to say I did it to relax a little bit. As much as I'm relaxing watching movies and TV shows or whatever, palling around with the kids and all that, just 15, 20 minutes just to read one comic book. And, and yeah. so far, it's working out really well, so I'm, I'm really trying to stick to it. So Starman's one of those things. I myself, too, Shane. Oh, it's so hard. Um, for what James Robinson did with this character and his legacy, the Starman legacy, he, like Chris said, touched absolutely every iteration of Starman you could possibly think of, mm-hmm. from Ted Knight to Mikhail Thomas to Prince Gavin to Ted's son David to then Jack to even... Uh, Courtney, who was Star Girl, mm-hmm. but yet at the tour, through things that happen, Jack kind of bequeaths her the legacy to even the Legion of Superheroes, Tom Caller, Starman. It, it's it's all there. It's all connected, mm-hmm. and they each build upon each other. He even incorporated that one time back in 1951 when yeah, Batman yeah. became Starman yep, for yep. one story. Uh, <laughs> managed it, to work that in. It, it's just an absolute fantastic storytelling and 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 a a, a great growing of a character who in the beginning really wanted nothing to do with his father's legacy of Starman, um, w- was pretty standoffish about it. And, and they even butted heads in that first story arc about it. Um, but through what happens in that first story arc, he really decided, well, I'll do it for now. I'll, 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 I'll just do it until things are back to a normal. And, and it just progresses from there for an 81 issue series and, and some, annuals and some crossovers um some tie-ins uh it just it never stops being well done it never stops being interesting never stops letting jack grow um well beyond anything he himself expected to be uh i related to the to the way the character is written in the collecting habits that jack had and his fondness for things old toys and and just Pop culture paraphernalia mm-hmm. like um, tin lunch boxes, transistor oh, radios. Yeah. Oh god, his his shop, um, a Knight's Tale. Is that what it was That's, called? Yes, that is. What, or night, or was it Knight's, Knight's Past? I think Knight's, it was Knight's Past. Knight's Past. Past. Um, such a such an interesting way to to put something into a character 
uh, as well as watching him grow into everything that happened to him. And again, I'm trying to be vague because if you've never read it, um, as much as I love Booster Gold, Blue Beetle, Batman, JLA, and all that, the 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 series of Starman is some of the finest work I have ever read in my life um, for the journey that they take Jack on and and where it leads him to. Um, you you also get such an interesting. Um, Oh God! What would you call it? It's such an interesting interpretation of the shade hmm. in through that yes. that whole book. Uh, it, it it just blew me away. Um, you have great times past stories that involve various characters uh, in Jack's history as well as Starman's history, mm-hmm. and uh, I think James Robinson even carried that over to his most recent Wonder Woman work. Um, God, he did it on something else, too. Uh, Hawkman. Hawkman had some times past kind of stories. Um, just a fantastic idea. And I and I really felt like, like James Robinson's run on Starman really made something like that such a solid way of storytelling. Um, that if it happened before and, and I just never noticed it, that's fine. But, but boy, the way they did it in, in Starman, just above and beyond anything else I'd read. So it, it, it always has a special place in my heart. Um, it, it's that series being so self-contained and God, it, total aesthetic n- nonsense here, but what a perfect way for DC to do omnibuses in six volumes that you can actually carry around without breaking your armor back. Um, I, I applaud that is the finest example of what I'd like to see a series come out as in trade and hardback is, is the way they did those six volumes. Um, that series means so much to me as I was growing up through getting married and having kids and now even with, with what's happened with my father uh, in the last year. That story means so much to me that I think that would be the one thing that if I was told you could take one story, one collected volume, one something to a desert island, and that's what you'd have to read forever – that would be what I pick. As much as I love JLA, Batman, Booster, Beetle, all that, and I could reread so many of them so many times, the one thing that, that really tugs at my heart and, and, and stays in my head at all times is Starman, Jack Knight's Starman. Um, even at my desk at work, I, I've always had what I think was the original – uh, advertisement of it with a quote from Oscar Wilde. All oh, right, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Yeah, I put that quote in my uh, senior yearbook entry. Actually. Nice, nice. Um, I have a, a, a smaller version of that that I've printed off the computer, and that's always at my desk at work, um, just sitting there. Uh, it, it's just it's it's a fantastic piece of artwork. It's a fantastic quote. Um, yeah, I, I really do love that series almost more than than any other comic series i've ever read and and like chris said it's 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 almost perfection the way it's it's drawn it's written um everybody involved the the coloring the letter or the the inker the artist every it's just spectacular to read through i, I appreciate that the on uh, the omnibus uh collections are so complete that they even included oh. the uh, the hellboy oh, yes uh crossover with, yeah they did Batman, starman and hellboy uh, an omnibus the way they are are not my favorite way to read books because they're just too darn large you can't carry them around really anywhere yeah. i don't like books that when you open them up you're almost afraid to just break break the spine right away <laughs> the way that those starman volumes came out is just about perfection they're able to support their own weight oh my god yeah and you, you can car- i take the dust jacket off of course but you can carry it around and read it um it's easy to read when you're sitting at home. Uh, it's just perfect. Could it's a shame happened. they never finished uh, completing the trade paperback collections because I know that oh, that I know. volume solicited like four times and wound up getting canceled like over and over again. Yep, and and that's something I, I really wish they would have put in a hardback was the Shade miniseries that came out with the New 52 to kind of go along with that formatting, but at least we got a trade of that. I mean, I yeah. have the issues, of course, too, but but at least there was a trade of that put out. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a huge fan of the uh, of the Starman character, and I, I've got uh, the, all those on on the on the boo uh, sitting on my on my shelf, uh, looking at him right now, and I've got a Steve Bryant Starman uh, on my wall as oh, well. Nice. So that's it's uh, it, one of those characters that uh, 
the the book exudes love, mm-hmm. and, and you don't you don't get to, you don't get to say that a lot about about a comic book where you can actually feel the love on each individual page, and and it's there for the character and and for the for the family and for the relationships. It's just it's it's pretty much a perfect book. Yeah, and for all the um all the other DC characters that come in and out of that series uh, to help defend Opal, especially through, uh, I always, I might pronounce it wrong. Grand, Grand Guaganol. Oh, Grand Guignol. Thank you. Um, you could not pull from a more rich group of characters that really didn't have any business being together at all. Adam Strange, Elongated Man, Black Condor. Oh, it's just <laughs> such a great Phantom Phantom Lady. Fat- oh yes, um, another le- well, she's part of the Knight Family legacy too. Oh yeah, 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 she is. Gosh, then then to build on that, you have the whole Odair legacy throughout that entire title, mm-hmm. uh, which is just fantastic unto itself. Um, not to even mention the Mist side, the villainous side mm. of it, the legacy that's in there with the Mist and his kids. Oh, it, it just just exudes excellent storytelling. Mm. At its finest. Yeah. James Robinson and friends didn't invent the concept of legacy in superhero comics, no. but they arguably reinvented it. Yeah, they really took it to a, a level that I never really thought I'd, I'd see. I mean, I always appreciated legacy in the DC Universe and, and, and Marvel as well, but Starman really took it to another place that I just – I didn't start reading that right away either. I came in like two years into it. Um, because of a Halloween costume, I was trying to make some quick and easy Halloween costume. I and, think I've seen pictures of that quick and easy yeah, Halloween costume, and it, it was nice and easy to do. And then I thought, well, I'll, I'll read this annual that I bought or this issue, and I'm like, well, now wait a minute. And then I went back and I read, read everything. It was it just blew me away. Two things: uh, quick and easy uh, uh, Halloween costumes. That's how I went as Bob Ross this year, because <laughs> all, I, all I had to do was buy a wig and wear a wear a shirt and. Uh, get myself a, an easel to paint on, and I was good to go. <laughs> and uh, if you haven't actually read yet, uh, I'm not sure because you said you're front, you're a little bit behind, uh, uh, Shane. But make sure to read uh, the Flash Rebirth uh, storyline that the Shade is in, um, the Speed of Darkness. I don't know if I knew that he was in that. Yeah, uh, it, it it was uh, back in uh, 2016. So oh, it was, oh, oh, you know, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, um, that that was uh, written by Joshua Williamson, right right after Rebirth uh, started. This is issue ten uh, okay. of, of the series, and uh, it's it's very much in the same vein of the shade that you get in Starman because because of the nature of the shade. Uh, I, I I won't give anything away for anybody who hasn't read it, but if you've read Starman, you're going to appreciate this version of the shade that, that is presented in, in this, in this flash uh, arc that took place. I think it was a two issue arc. Huh? I don't know yeah. that I knew that that was out there. Yep. Well, def- definitely track it down because okay. it's it, it, in some ways you could almost see it as an epilogue, not only for shades story, but uh, in some ways, even the pre 52 story. Hmm. Okay. Very good. All right. All right. looks like that's brought us around the ring for the last time. Uh, okay, but now the lightning round oh, of yeah, alternate choices. I'm not going to elaborate on any of them, though. Yeah. But when we do them. I okay. wouldn't blame you if you did, Shane. Okay. I have no room to blame you if you did. <laughs> All right, I, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through mine go uh, quick. Um, I've got uh, Eric Masterson, Thor slash Thunderstrike. Very good. Uh, yep. Uh, he, was, he was great as Thor, uh, gave, a, gave a real personable personality to him, and as Thunderstrike, that continued. Yes, I'm going to mention Ben Riley. <laughs> He's on mine. You should. He's on mine too. I love that character. I wish Excellent. they would do something better with him than what they are now. I'm not. Well, Peter David's him. writing him now. That's, I know. I know. It's, it's good. It, it's really. Good. They brought back the Slingers too. Maybe I'll have to give it love another try. Right I, I read a couple issues and I was like, eh, uh. I'll have to read the Slingers issues for sure okay. because that, I was I was really big on the Slingers back in the day. Me too. Yeah, as was I. Jakeem Thunder. Oh. Uh, uh, about the, that. Uh, the the JSA's uh, newer newest version newer version of the Thunderbolt mm. um, was absolutely in my wheelhouse. I mean, uh, a, a young a young black kid uh, g- gets the gets the Thunderbolt and uh, and uses him uh, in unique and interesting ways. And it was a terrific way to to use Legacy uh, in in the JSA titles of the mid two thousands. So I was really a big fan of that. Um, along those same lines, Mister Terrific. Uh, Michael Holt, 
uh, had to be mentioned by me at some point because uh, he 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 made fair play cool, and and you got all the T spear the T spheres, and I'm looking forward to that not fantastic four title that DC is uh, going to be putting <laughs> yeah. out with uh, with Mister Terrific yeah. in the uh, Reed Richards role, so, so that should be pretty cool. Um, Young Avengers, uh, of all iterations. Uh, they're they're a they're they're the Teen Titans of the Marvel Universe, and uh, I, you could easily see a bunch of these wind up taking the place of the Avengers at some point in time. And along those lines, I also have uh, a next on my list because even if she was a villain in that series, uh, Hope Pym got her start there. So uh, Ant Man and the Wasp, uh, a trailer just just launched. Uh, the the day before we're recording this uh, here, and uh, that character would not exist without a next. Hmm. I didn't realize I, that. Yeah, I didn't either. Actually, thank thank you for pointing that out, Ian. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, she was she was a uh, she was a villain uh, character. Uh, the uh, uh, Scott Lang's uh, a, uh, daughter was a member of a next, and then the villain the vil- villainous revengers uh, were led by uh, by Hope uh, Pym. Uh, so that, that that that's how that worked, and also Scott Wang is on my list because he he was he's the cool Ant Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, for one more, um, a an indie title that uh, you, people might not be aware of. Uh, it's called Stray. Uh, it's written by Vito Del Sante. Oh, yes, um, and it's Action Lab series. Indeed, uh, and uh, it's it's along the lines of a Nightwing style story, uh, but uh, done really well as uh, as uh, a a teen character who grows up and has to take over the mantle of his fallen uh, of the fallen Doberman, uh, and uh, and that and that's what Stray is. So that uh, that worked really well, and uh, I believe there's more to come for that for that character uh, in in certain way uh, aspects. I think there might be a new ongoing happening there. And Vito's a Vito's a great guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him at New York Comic Con or something along those lines, you should definitely do so. Uh, one of the Action Lab crew, so. There be my alternates. Yeah. Scott right. Lang is a great choice. And yeah. uh, I do have a couple of issues of The Stray in my uh, pile someplace, Ian, probably because of your recommendation. Nice. All right. Here is my lightning round. Um, Nick Fury and his son, uh, hmm. Sandman, sure. Sandy, and The Sand. Um, mm-hmm. Nova, his father and son, which I read the the a little bit of the story of his son becoming Nova. We were talking about Sam Alexander here, yeah. right? Yeah, um, but then I fell away from it. Um, Dr. Fate, Kent Nelson, um, his son? Uh, he right? never had a son. Never but, had uh, a son. Uh, there have been a couple different Doctors' fate. Uh, the first one to take over was a little boy named Eric Strauss, who uh, teamed up with his stepmother, and uh, the two of them had kind of a... <laughs> Uh, he he was rapidly aged to adulthood, and they had a relationship. Uh, okay. Uh, is there somebody else here? I thought there was somebody else in there too, but uh, like, there was, was the, there. Uh, uh, well, Hector Hall wasn't Hector he? Hall, that's okay. it. Oh, right. That's it. Thank you. You're right, but that that's Hawkman's son. That's though. Hawkman's son. Yeah. Yep. Um, I did have Green Arrow with Ollie Connor and um, um, Arsenal Speedy. Red Arrow, Roy, Roy, whatever you want to keep going, because he he that's another character that did a, they did a great job of letting him grow up too mm. as time went on. Yeah. Um, a little more turbulence in his uh, yeah in his oh, maturation God, yeah. process. Oh, absolutely. But but when he got to Red Arrow, I really loved him as Red Arrow when Ollie was not Green Arrow. Yeah, at so that time. This is during like the James Robinson um, in Justice League. Period. Yeah, even a little bit before that. I God, I forget who wrote it when he first came on. Brad Meltzer, uh, it was the first one to write that Justice League series Excellent. with Red Arrow. Um, I'm going to stretch this a little bit. Booster Gold and Supernova. Even though they didn't, the younger Booster Gold, the, the regular universe Booster Gold didn't realize what was going on. But still, that's an interesting twist on a legacy oh, character sure. Well, me. the Supernova identity itself is kind of a legacy of like Silver Age Superman comics. Yeah. So. Um, Thor, of course, with Thor and Jane, uh, Jane Foster right now. Um, I had on Green Arrow with Hal, John, Ka- uh, Guy, and Kyle. Um, Iron Man with Tony, and I went with your your thought earlier that War Machine would be an acceptable legacy character sure. in there. Um, Definitely. Let's see. Captain America with Steve, Bucky, Sam, and U.S. Agent. Um, I had Kid Flash with Barry, Wally, and Bart, and I had Flash with J. Barry, Wally, and then Murd and I were talking and included Bart in that as well. I had on Peter Parker and Ben Riley for Spider-Man and Scarlet Spider. 
And another thing that Adam and I talked about before the show, I have our man on here for Rex and – God, I forget his name even though. Rick. Rick. And also the android. And the android. Um, Joyce. I had – I'm going to say that for the villains. All right. I had, did have Batman on an alternate list with Bruce, Dick, who became Batman for a while, and Asbats. Um, I have Superman with Clark, Steel, Connor, Eradicator, Cyborg. And you could even, I think, stretch that to Supergirl, Superboy, the, even in the Legion of Superheroes kind of time frame. I had um, Stargirl and Stripe, which also were from, oh, my God, my memory's failing from the Golden Age stuff. Oh, the Star-Spangled Kid. star Thank yeah. you. That was Jeff Johns' first um, ongoing work from DC mm-hmm. and his first uh, dabbling in the legacy pool as well. And what a great way to bring Courtney into everything. It was. Um, Courtney is based on his sister, if I remember correct. correctly. Right. His, that is his, correct. His late sister. Yeah. Um, Wolverine, I had Logan, Old Man Logan, and X-23. Um, nice. Let's see. Shield and Shield, that... Short lived series that oh, right. I love so well. Um, I know that's not quite legacy, but and then they better finish that. They they have like two uh, issues left. They better finish it. I wish they would. And then I had all the teams, which I talked about in the episode anyway. So <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Uh, top of my list of alternates. The first thing I wrote down, actually, oddly enough, is the only non Marvel DC character on the whole list is uh, from Astro City, Jack in the Box. Oh, nice. Arguably the coolest clown-themed superhero ever invented. I would buy a Jack in the Box monthly series in a heartbeat. Uh, I have Kamala Khan, as I said earlier. Uh, Tim Drake, Janice Vell, uh, Hal Jordan. That's a Green Lantern. Hal Jordan, not Airwave. Hal Jordan, but uh, he who was at one time my favorite character in all of comics, as I've said, uh, you know, despite my you know, really. <laughs> Only uh, adopting a character I barely knew anything about as a favorite, but he just didn't seem to fit the legacy theme quite as well as some others, so I, I left him off my top five list in the oh, end. Hey, hey, what about Spectre? Hey, come on, he was part of the oh, Spectre. right, legacy. yeah. Mm, that's true, too. That's a good one, is, too. That's a great idea for a legacy character, too, because yeah. that's it was established by uh, Ostrander, I think, in the 90s, that, that the Spectre was a mantle, too. It wasn't yeah. just Jim Corrigan. There have actually been... Like hundreds or thousands of specters over the years. Yeah. yeah. Vessels of God's wrath. So, yeah. It's a and I enjoyed what they did with Christmas Allen getting that mantle mm. as well. Yes. Oh, hell, for the question, for that matter. Crap. Mm. Oh, another good one. <laughs> so many. Yes. Genre the, is replete with mm-hmm. legacies. Uh, we got the Ray. Uh, oh, the, yeah. the Joe Quesada Ray uh, carrying on for the Golden Age character. Um, I've got a couple of uh, Legionnaires on here, actually. Uh, Brainiac 5. You know, just a. Not, not unlike the uh, Black Knight, he's uh, carrying on a, uh, attempting to carry forward a thousand-year-old legacy of villainy yeah. and uh, turning it towards the right. Uh, we've also got XS, the uh, less annoying of Barry Allen's two grandchildren. I'm pretty sure she's appearing on The Flash right now. It's, it's, oh, it's kind of been on the right. TV show, that is. So they've been of, hinting oh. at it. I, I, I'm not sure if they have actually gotten there yet. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're sort of te- – I think in – if it wasn't this week's episode, it was last, last week's. Week, you see uh, her writing something. A mysterious was... young woman who looks very much as uh, XS Jenny Ognatz did in the Legion comics, okay. writing in what looked like Interlac. Uh huh. And I was trying to figure out who she was supposed to be. All right. Very good. And she was a fun character too. She was very upbeat and and peppy and energetic, yeah. w- without being too annoyingly so. She was uh, kind of like Pinkie Pie if she were a Legionnaire. Okay. And also, you know, on her meds. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, and also, uh, this is kind of a deeper cut from the Legion. Thunder, who is a wielder of the power of Shazam, who was briefly a member of the oh. Legion. It's, I, I liked that. I like the idea of the Marvel family being represented in the 31st century. Oh, sure. And she wasn't there for more than a year or two before Abnett and Lanning came along, and then she got shunted away. Um, Hawkman, of course, yeah. interesting embodiment of the concept of legacy because the legacy he inherits is always his own. Yeah. And on that note, uh, the entire membership of Infinity Inc. could probably be put in here. My favorites, though, are uh, Jade and Obsidian, you know, the twin kids of uh, mm-hmm. Alan, Alan Scott, Scott and sure. uh, the Golden Age villainous, the Thorn. Um, uh, the Huntress. Oh, that's a good one, too. That's a big deal there. The daughter of the Earth 2 Batman. And Brainwave Jr., another... Uh, Inheritor of a villainous legacy attempting to uh, reorient it towards good. I always, I always liked Hank King Jr., but he's another one that's been kind of battered about by fate and mm-hmm. not treated very well. Um, let's see. Uh, Freedom Beast, the uh, inheritor of the mantle of Buana Beast, oh, as, uh, created nice. by Grant Morrison in his Animal Man run. Dominic Mindawe of South Africa. Uh, Red Devil, former sidekick to one of my favorite uh, characters, Blue Devil. Sure. Became... Uh, 
yeah, he became a literal devil, kind of the way Blue Devil did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, this is a part of uh, Jeff Johns' Teen Titans series. Um, uh, Ryan Stegman's sketch of him at a, at a uh, super show, uh, I think the, the, the second one. Ooh, nice. You hang on to that. Yes. Um, JSAers, again, like almost any member of the latter day oh, JSA would be good too. Yeah. We, we, we've, uh, you know, Ian reminded us of Mr. Terrific. You, and you had, uh, Sandy, the, the golden boy. Uh, Sand Hawkins is actually my latter day JSA representative on my alternates mm-hmm. list. Been through some interesting changes and he sure has. came out of it a, a new man. Um, Chris had his, uh, uh, Captain America commie smasher. And as I said, I'm saving that for my villains list. But I did have a couple of uh, Golden Age characters that uh, Roy, Thomas by, uh, Roy Thomas, by means of retcon, established as uh, Captain America legacy holders. Mm-hmm. In one of the only what-if stories Marvel published that uh, ultimately was incorporated into continuity. You know, the first appearance of Spider-Girl being mm-hmm. another, albeit yep. in an alternate universe. Yep. Um, but yeah, it affected mainstream Marvel reality. It asked the question, what if the invaders had stayed together after World War II? And it answered the question of how Captain America could have been around in all those issues of all winners comics um, if Cap had gone into a block of ice. And the answer is a couple of other patriotic uh, 1940s active characters, the Patriot and the Spirit of 76, both uh, consecutively took on the mantle of Captain America. Spirit of 76, I should add, was not a genuine Golden Age character. He was one that Roy Thomas himself made up as a part of his Invaders series in the 70s. Mm-hmm. He was supposed to be an analog of DC's Uncle Sam. Mm-hmm. It was during a, a brief little feud, that uh, a friendly feud, between sure. the creative teams of freedom fighters at DC and Invaders at Marvel in the 70s. They created uh, like villainous analogs of each other's characters just to <laughs> tweak each other's noses a little. So that's how we got the Spirit of 76. But he then became incorporated into Cap's legacy. And he's uh, from Philadelphia, too. Nice. So he's kind of a hometown boy for yeah. us CGSers. Never hurts. Uh, we got Owen Mercer, the uh, super speedy son of Captain Boomerang. Nice. Yes. I oh, I loved Owen. Owen was my man. Mm. My boy's <laughs> got speed. <laughs> <laughs> Out, that, Outsiders was, was a terrific book back in the day, and he, he, was, he was one of the pillars of that. Yeah. Yep, and uh, things are shaping up in the Black Lightning TV show, actually, to see some yeah. Outsider-related happenings. Yep. Nice. We actually saw an issue of the 1990s Outsider series on screen for a little bit in this week's episode. Oh, nice. I didn't watch that yet. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm not spoiling the plot. No, no, but, no. Uh, no. That's cool. Uh, let's see. We've got the, uh, the Tarantula, uh, the, the, the Latina version that was introduced by Chuck Dixon in Nightwing, Catalina Flores, mm-hmm. Carrying on for the Golden Age hero, John Law, the original Tarantula. That's another great series. Uh, we've got uh, the Katarina Armstrong version of Spy Smasher, introduced by Gail Simone in uh, Birds of Prey. Excellent. Nice. Yeah, that's real. Mm. That's probably got more in common with actual intelligence agents than most superheroes do. Mm-hmm. And she was not afraid to kill to get the job done. She's a character that uh, I really wish we could see a little bit more of. Um, I threw the Android Hour Man into my list after talking with you uh, nice. before we began here. And I'm going to finish up my alternates list with a couple of the great uh, legacy bearers of the Silver Age, Zatanna oh. and Black Canary, Dinah nice. Laurel Lance. Nice. Yes. I, I, have, I have three more that I want to add now that you, you got me on a DC kick and I immediately had to mention Kate Spencer, Manhunter. Mm. Oh. Yeah, a lot of legacy stuff going on in that series. Yeah. Very much so. Uh, And also, uh, Hero, as in Dial H4. Oh, Oh, yeah. So we're talking like a Chris King carrying on for Robbie Reed, and then everybody who got the H dial in that wonky H-E-R-O series in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I I loved that series back in the early 2000s. And uh, also, obviously, Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel has to be mentioned, uh, just because we mentioned the other Captain Marvel. We might as well mention Carol. Sure. It's only fair. <laughs> all right, yep. all right. Well, I guess that uh, brings the wagons back into the barn. Then it sure does. This has been a really fun episode. Yeah, it was. A lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah, great time. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, recommending this topic, Ian. It was a it was a humdinger. Absolutely, my pleasure. And I, I, I I'd be remiss not to bring up the fact that uh, we just passed twelve years since the first time I met uh, the yeah. CGS guys in person. Sure did. Because. Oh, well. uh, CGS episode 100, mm-hmm. yep. January 26th, 2006. Yep. And you remain one of very few people, Ian, who have um, maintained a perfect record of attending That's all of right. our CGS live <laughs> events since then. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, my absolutely my pleasure, guys. And it's <laughs> uh, time flies when you're having fun, and, uh, and I, I love being out with you guys. And it's been two and a half hours, so time has indeed flown. Yeah, it sure has. <laughs> I'm getting texts like, uh, "Are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. Just <laughs> yes, he's, he's alive, Carlene. Don't <laughs> yeah, worry. We'll, running late. You'll get him back intact. <laughs> This one, this one's for you, Sean. Ra- Sean Whalen, talking about uh, long, right. long, 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 long episodes. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Norge of Raging Bullets, yes. one of the most intense and long-winded DC Comics fans you'll ever meet. Love it. And speaking of other podcasts, Ian, would you like to uh, slip in a little plug for uh, comic timing here before we finish sure. up? Definitely. Uh, yeah. So you can find my my stuff over at comictiming.net. It's a little less regular than it was uh, even a year ago, just because uh, life's gotten in the way a little bit. But uh, we try to get out at least an episode a month, if not uh, every month and a half. Uh, but lately, it's been uh, Brandon Christopher, Brent Casina, and myself, plus at least like one other, usually just catching up on what we've been reading and uh, what movies have come out in recent memory. Uh, probably going to put out a uh, best of 2017 show now that we're in, uh, approaching February, uh, just to sort of, uh, you know, put a capper on the year that's that's gone by. So that'll probably be there in the next week or so. And I have a bunch of interviews that never got released from, like, even, like, last C2E2 that I still need to get out there in New York Comic Con. So uh, they'll be they'll be on the feed. I, I need to get them out there for my sake because I keep remembering it and then banging my head up against the wall and I haven't gotten them out there for you guys. So uh, comictiming.net for all of your comic timing goodness. And, uh, yeah, if you want to listen to some old appearances of the Comic Geek Speak guys, too, just go ahead and look into my archive. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Ian, for suggesting this and for helping us to bring it to life. My, my pleasure, and uh, I look forward to villains once that happens. Oh, yes. But uh, before it does, Chris actually has a pretty neat idea for a top five episode. Yeah, that we will, it does. We'll do that in between times. Sure. Nice. As for now, though, this Top 5 Legacy Heroes episode was brought to you by the Denver Independent Comic and Art Expo, a.k.a. DINK, and its 2018 DINKY Awards. If you're an independent creator, publisher, etc., who would like your comic or related product to be considered for entry in that awards uh, program, uh, just go to dinkdenver.com and enter it soon, because uh, the deadline is approaching. Visit us at ComicGeekSpeak.com to send an email. The address is ComicGeekSpeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. Stop by TheComicForums.VanillaForums.com and let us know what your top five legacy characters are. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who contributes to the episode. We couldn't do it without you. And always stay tuned for my yoink from Adam because he does them an awful lot. You never know when it's coming. That's right. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes one listener at a time.